The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Thank you so much for downloading this episode of So What Do You Really Do? The podcast where I, your host, Dead Air Dennis Maller, speaks to artists and entertainers about their day jobs. And the person talking about their day job on today's production is my good pandemic friend, Mark Hoffmeyer. Yes, I call him a pandemic friend, uh, but we are friends. Uh, we will be friends in real life. I missed, uh, we missed schedules when I was in LA a couple uh, weeks ago, uh, which by the way, I went to LA for a week and did comedy. And the reason I was able to do that, uh, and have that kind of time off was because, um, uh, I tricked my job into letting me schedule a vacation in the middle of my two week notice. That's right. I left the job. Uh, I don't talk about the job really much. Uh, my day job for the past few months from May until the end of February was I did AV tech at a hotel because pandemic killed all hopes of being a full time uh, entertainer that I had pre pandemic, uh, the lifestyle I was living pre pandemic. Uh, so I went back into the to the industry that I know so well, uh, and that is running microphone cables and cameras and all that stuff. Um, and maybe I'll open up about the job uh, one day on the podcast. But for right now, I'm glad to be out of it. Uh, Oh, Dennis, you're out of that. Are you back to being a full-time entertainer? No, not uh, technically. Uh, I am, uh, by the time you hear this episode, hopefully I will either be on or shortly on my way uh, to being a full-fledged uh, narrator and tour guide for the Boston Duck Tours. Uh, for longtime listeners, you might remember the Boston Duck Tours uh, because it is now the... Uh, I would say infamous, but it's not Uh lost episode of the podcast. It aired and then had to get pulled off um, years and years ago. So those who are around from the beginning may have heard the episode with a Boston duck tour driver. Maybe we'll have another driver on the podcast uh, soon. Um, or maybe I'll even talk about my experiences at the end of the season uh, come November, December. We shall see how that works out. But yes, right now I'm currently and have been for the past few weeks training, learning everything I can about Boston history, the city that I despise. By the way, I pitched them. Can I just do my entire tour? Just be a roast of the city of Boston and the history. And they, uh, emphatically said, no, they were not a fan of that idea. Uh, so this is, uh, I may not have this job long. Uh, I'm trying, uh, they, we'll see how it works out. I'm going to have a lot of fun with the job. Hopefully, People who take my tours will also have the same amount of fun. That's what we aim for. Uh, that's what I always aim for. Uh, I am still hosting trivia for those who uh, like uh, to follow me on my trivia nights. Uh, those uh, are there. And for those who have not followed my trivia nights, uh, all that information is at deadairdentist.com. D-E-A-D-A-I-R-D-E-N-N-I-S. Of course, you knew that because you came to this podcast and you saw my name right in the logo and in the podcast uh, which, by the way, you may notice we have a brand new logo. We have a new image. Thank you, uh, uh, Big Comedy. We This should be the very first official now episode released uh, under the Big Comedy Network uh, for So What Do You Really Do? Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for being a part of this. If you're a longtime listener, you've probably heard Scott Henry, who is one of the uh, heads of it, him and his wife, um, Catherine, are the... Uh, brought me into the fold of their brand new emerging comedy network and I cannot be any more excited for it. So I'm happy to be a part of it. I'm ecstatic. Things are finally moving. We're getting things in order. Uh, so there'll be a lot of new additions and, and updates and cool things happening in the future. Uh, and if you're a longtime listener, you know that you've been, in, you've told me the good, you know, the congratulations. And if you're a new listener, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hopefully you're having a good time uh, and uh, you are sharing this podcast with friends and family because that is the best way to get any of my guests out there in the world is to share this with them. That's what this podcast is for, is to highlight interesting people. And speaking of interesting people, the interesting person on today's podcast is a comedian from L.A. that I met through doing Zoom shows during the pandemic. And he has written for some of my favorite sh TV shows and uh, and cartoons growing up. And that's one of the things, many of the things that we talk about. Uh, Mark is a swell guy. He's amazingly positive and nice and super talented. Like, he, he's a writer for TV for 20, 30 years. Like, almost as long as I've been alive, he's been a writer and in high demand. He is 
been part of some of our my favorite shows, Spider-Man the Animated Series, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and so many more. We talk about all of them. We talk about meeting Stanley. We talk about being invited to going to comic book conventions. We, we go through, sorry, there's no visuals. Uh, maybe I'll put them out on social media, some of the uh, exclusive Comic-Con uh, swag that he has gotten that we talk about uh, in the podcast. And I was I, I'm envious of his career. Uh, I'm envious of his positivity. And uh, he is a swell guy. And I'm really glad he got to do. Uh, he really came on the podcast. Uh, we also did an episode of uh, Word of the Day with Comedians, my other podcast slash YouTube show. Um, and that episode will be coming out shortly when I get around to editing it. Hopefully now with my new job at Boston Duck Tours, I will have built in time to be able to work on podcast stuff. That's the objective. That and getting out of debt. Those are the objectives <laughs> for the Boston Duck Tours. But your objective today is to continue to keep listening to this podcast and i hope that you find uh my guest mark as interesting and as funny and as swell as i do uh, i'm really glad he was on it It was a great talk and honestly we could do a whole nother episode about all the things he's done in his life uh outside of the things we talked about here writing for tv comic books tv shows improv stand-up uh, so in the meantime, please enjoy my episode, my conversation with comedian, writer, Mark Hoffmeyer. That's a crazy thing to think about, by the way, that neither of us have like touched our computers in like days or weeks when like during the pandemic, we were just nonstop on our well, computers. For me, it's like, so I use my laptop mainly so that, you know, I'm using that every day, but my son's old gaming computer is still good for doing you know, certain things. It's got two screens. So I sometimes boot it up for stuff and just, I, I know something's going on when I start it and I can't like programs won't start and I can see wheels are turning. And then I, I, you know, I start the, uh, the, uh, um, whatever that task screen is to see what's going on. And I can see that process, like it's updating all it's antivirus stuff and it's updating it's anti malware. And then it's like, and then it's telling me it needs to just update windows. And I'm like, okay, fine. Just, uh, I'm just going to go away for a while and you do your thing, you know? Well, one of the problems with my computer with rebooting is it in the reboot process always stops is like, Hey, there's something missing. Do you want to reboot anyway? Press a button. So if I reboot the computer, I have to be here to reboot. Oh, yeah. it. I can't just be like reset and go away. I have yeah. to be here to hit buttons, which is not how computers are supposed to work. No, <laughs> I should take not it anymore, to get fixed. But, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, it's okay. We'll all, we'll all be replaced by AI anyway soon. You know, <laughs> I love, I love the, I sort of love how quickly the, so like the the Lenza AI, you know, that photo thing, how quickly that went from being a cool thing to being you're stealing uh, people's artwork on the to to now nobody wants you to use it. I mean, that that happened in about four weeks, right, where people are like Look at these cool <laughs> yeah. pictures on oh, a week and a half. It was. Yeah. And the week and a half, it went like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. Look at all these pictures. Oh, I hate this. Oh, it's stealing my information. Oh, I want it to die. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was I was like, wow. OK. You know, I'm like I'm like. By the time I had decided, okay, I'll, I'll get a few pictures made. I can use for promos. Now I can't use them because everybody hates it. So I'm like, okay, fine, <laughs> fine. Yeah, I looked at it and went, oh, this is the thing that everyone's going to jump on, and I'm not early enough adopter to where, I, where I'll be ahead of the curve, so I'm not going to be a part of this. And then towards the hatred stage, I was like, kind of wish I, I I jumped in. Kind of yeah. wish I had yeah. just, <laughs> been just part for of the, it. Yeah, just for the sake of it. But it's it's. Uh, you know, now the, 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 the worrying thing is, and this happened a few years ago with my uh, fantasy football league, is we were run through CBS, the CBS site, and it started a few years ago. On Mondays, it would produce its own AI written reports on, on what happened in the league and who played whom. And it would be like written with sports jargon. And like one of the guys writes me goes, Hey, thanks for sitting down and writing this thing. I said, I, I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> right. This is, this is a, a, a computer doing this. And then I realized too, it would send me things that would say, do you want to change the gender in this story? Which of course I would change the gender in the articles that I was mad at one of my buddies. Right. Ah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, using misgendering to prank you, prank your friends for winning at fantasy. I know football. exactly who hasn't been who there. Who hasn't been there? Exactly. <laughs> it's like wow, you know. 
it's not well it, we can't use any kind of insult anymore in jest with our friends for anything so we might as well just be making up using the uh woke terms that everyone else is using well for and i'm like i haven't i because i you know during the pandemic i didn't start doing uh i, I stopped doing fantasy football it just became too much time spent on computers and stuff but i'm like now i wonder if they have you know like it, you know, uh, he, she, they, not, you know, non-gender specific. They must. I mean, they must have that if you need to change uh, the gender on the on the articles that you want the computer to generate for you. You know. <laughs> well, I want to change all the Tom Brady's to they's just to make all the Boston fans in here that still love him just mad when they're like, uh, uh, he is not a they. He is the ultimate he. I, I love the fact that uh, <laughs> so the sports collectible house Leland's sold i think it was leland's might have been heritage auctions they sold tom brady's last uh when he initially retired they sold his last touchdown football for like six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and they had to unsell it the fan had to give it back and they had to give him his money back because tom brady unretired i was like wow you know now this is why i'm glad you and i are having this conversation because when that was all going on i started writing uh in my head of course i'm not an act i'm not like a real writer like you are but in my head i was writing this the the you know buddy sitcom uh, the not sitcom but the buddy comedy movie where the the fan buys we weren't gonna i wasn't gonna call him tom brady but like the mega right. ultra superstar sports guy buys his last uh touchdown football or home run yeah, or whatever yeah. And then he retires and he has it. And he's like, this is, I got it. I spent my entire life savings on this ball, whatever this or that. And then it comes to mind now and goes, you know what? I'm unretiring. And then the ball's worth nothing. Yeah, yeah. Like he bought it in the anticipate. Like uh, I think in the, in the, the, the script was he catches like the, the, the last home run from that guy and he retires and then decides he has this gold mine right, right. and he's about to sell it. And then. He unretires like, and now it's worth nothing. And now he has to go through him and his buddies join together to go to Tom Brady's house to kill him. So, break his leg. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> break, well, but not break his leg. I wanted uh, specifically to be ki- like they were going to try to talk him out of killing him and just like maiming him. But that was the story is them yeah. uh, 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 you know, road tripping to to Boston to secretly kill Tom Brady. Said that this baseball or this, this football, football is going to actually be worth the millions of dollars. Uh, and I was like. Uh, I should write that before somebody else does. And then I realized if I wrote it, no one would ever read it. Well, it's, <laughs> no one would ever get a chance to read it. It's like the fan that caught uh, Mike Judge's 62nd home run or Aaron Judge, uh, Mike Judge. I caught Aaron Judge. <laughs> I was going to say, Mike, Mike uh, Beavis yeah. and Butthead yeah, exactly. was also a baseball create, player. Create, uh, it was a 62nd home run ball. And I think he turned down $3 million from the Yanks to sell it back because he's like, you know, he of course, this was all through his lawyer because now he's got a lawyer, right? They think they can get more money. And I was always like, you, you better have that ball locked away somewhere. You better not lose that ball in the meantime, because you were offered $3 million for it, you know? <laughs> I was like. Yeah, I, you, I wouldn't even, you, you wouldn't even, have, I, I would sell baseball for a lot less money than that, because uh, I I grew up in the 80s as an Orioles fan, so now uh, I naturally hate sports, so. <laughs> uh, a, a, a friend of mine in my uh, improv group, who's also a writer that you might have heard of, uh, Ken Levine, uh, used to uh, be one of the announcers for the Orioles. Oh, really? Yeah, he's got a lot yeah. of great stories about. He 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 was an announcer. He did Dodger talk out here. He was the voice uh, of the Seattle um, Mariners. He also uh, worked in the booth uh, announcing for uh, the Padres, and he worked and he works in Baltimore. I know he works in Baltimore. So I mean, Ken Levine sounds like a name that yeah. I may have heard of at some time, but it, it sounds like familiar enough. But it also could be now. Here's a, here's the a, weird a, thing. Accessible name. He's, so. he, not only was he a baseball announcer, but Levine and Isaacs were one of the premier, probably the the premier uh, sitcom writing team. He worked on Cheers and Mash and Frasier and The Simpsons. I mean, oh, yeah, wow. he's got an incredible resume. But he know he he, he told me one day, uh, he, and now he now he's a playwright. And I did a short play of his, uh, a ten minute play, and he uh, he was telling me he said, oh yeah, I once had I once had dinner with Ricky Henderson. I said really, and he goes, yeah, I'm going to answer the first question that's on your mind. He did refer to himself in the third person. And I was like, oh. <laughs> when you 
yeah, when you meet such a character like that, you have to prep yourself for questions you're going to. Oh, that reminds me. Speaking of that, like my my favorite person who do, has like, oh, I've gotten all these questions so many times. I'm prepared with all the answer for it before you ask the questions. My favorite is um Tom. Uh, he played Biff yeah, on Back oh, yeah, to the Tom, Future. Tom, Tom, Tom Wilson. Wilson. Yeah, I. I Tom Wilson. Yeah. Not only he has his song, which is all the answers to questions, which is hilarious. Highly recommend everyone listening. It's a great song. Uh, pause this. Go to YouTube. Put Mark Wilson the questions. It's a hilarious Wilson, song. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. But then also he hands out headshots with the answers to all the questions on the back he, of his headshot. So uh, I used to do. Uh, I used to perform in a group called Comedy Sports Los Angeles. We used to be the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, improv group at the ice house in Pasadena Sunday nights were our gig. We we'd close the show on Sunday nights. It was really fun, but they'd have uh stand up shows before us. And we were in the green room one time when Tom Wilson came off stage and he had a sousaphone. He had a tuba that he'd come off stage with. Mm-hmm. And I go, wow, a tuba. I've seen you with a guitar. And he goes, yeah, I'm just trying something different tonight. I thought that was so funny. <laughs> Wait, 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 when was this? Was this this the, the, would have the, been in probably the mid nineties? Okay, Something like okay, that. yeah. So okay, that's why I asked uh, because I've, I'm a, I'm a fan of his. I used to listen to his podcast. Uh, I know he used to like he started stand up in the seventies, like before Back to the Future oh, was yeah, stand up, yeah. and he used to bring the tube on stage because he played it in high school. Um, and then he kind of gave up the tuba act. And I know he has talked about occasionally he brings the tuba back. So I was wondering, was this 70s like comedy store boom days? Was this mid 90s? Or was this like early but it was 2000s? just funny to see him come into the room with a full on tuba. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, dude, whatever works for you. <laughs> I thought this guy's trying something. So that, let's start with that. With with let's start with the stand up uh, comedy side of things. So when did you actually get into? When did you start doing stand up comedy? So I started doing stand up comedy in like the late eighties uh, in, in Los Angeles, and um, I I did some stand up, and then I I started doing improv. Um, and I worked mm-hmm. my the first improv uh, group I worked with was uh, there's a woman named D Marcus who taught classes, and D. Uh, was one of the founders of a group called Off the Wall. And Off the Wall was the um, house uh, improv group at the improv. And they Monday nights for like 15 years, they were there. And everybody came to see them. It's the improv group that Robin Williams started with. Robin Williams, John Ritter. Um, and so, I mean, that's how Robin Williams got famous here in L.A., uh, was he started with Off the Wall. And... Um, then I uh, I gravitated towards a group called Comedy Sports LA because they played improv comedy as a team sport, sort of, right? Um, yeah. They're kind of a franchise. We have a Comedy Sports Boston here that, yeah. you know, and that's like, I feel like maybe that's, if I got back into improv, that's probably the improv that I would most really want to do because I started in short form, get, short form games. Yeah, yeah. Because I started in high school in the 90s. And I, everything I wanted was it was to be, you know, whose line is in that anyway. Yeah. We had somebody come in and try to start teaching us Harold and more serious stuff. And we were kids and we didn't want to have any of that. And now I kind of regret that I didn't. Yeah. But I still think like for joke writing and humor, short form games. Yeah. You know, is, is it for, for good writing? You can be a hack or you can write some good stuff. You can, you know, bal- or, or learn to balance too. I've seen people that that it just strengthened their comedy game. And I've seen other people that's like, they just regress into the bottom of the barrel, low hanging fruit jokes every yeah, single and time. It's and it's obviously like, different muscles than stand up, and it's different muscles yeah. than other stuff, uh, but it's, you know, so, and comedy sports was founded by Dick Chudnow, who was one of the guys who was Kentucky fried theater and wrote with um, uh, uh, the Zucker brothers. He, he was one of the writers on airplane. Um, and, he he went back to I think he's from Milwaukee, either Milwaukee or Madison, Wisconsin. I think Milwaukee, and founded this, you know, comedy sports and spread it out as franchises across you know the U.S. because he wanted something that was fun and clean that families could do, but was comedic. And I guess he'd had enough of Hollywood, so I got to meet him. We did a tournament in Kansas City, and it was really fun. And now I'm doing improv again with uh, uh, Andy Goldberg has a group. Now, Andy was one of the founding members of off the wall and uh, D Marcus passed away a number of years ago. So Andy does it. And yeah, it's really fun because like you were saying, occasionally I'll get some gems of lines. And, you know, we were talking earlier about Ken Levine. 
And we were in class one day and the setup was, it was me and another actress. And the setup was, we're getting ready to go skydiving. And I don't know why, mm-hmm. but I'm standing on stage for some reason. I'm miming that I'm holding a drink as we're waiting <laughs> on this airplane. We've established her on this airplane. And I'm miming that I'm drinking. And she goes, she looks at me, she goes, you're drinking? I said, of course I'm drinking. I'm about to jump out of a plane. And, and Ken came up to me after class and he also does cartooning. He does cartoons uh, for the New Yorker. And he's like, can I draw that up? Can I steal that line and draw it up as a cartoon? I'm saying, yes, exactly. That's yeah, please. That's why we're here. You know, when you come up with those lines that you're like, yeah, where'd that come from? I, I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. Yes. This is the, like improv is supposed to be. This is all we do right here. This is, we live in the moment. This is a one-time experience. But then there's also those couple of gems where you're like, oh no, I have to share this joke with every person I've ever yeah. met in my entire yeah. life from now for the, until the day uh, I die. There- yeah, and that's, that is a good one. Cause like, that's the whole thing about like, they try to teach you in improv is like, don't be, don't stand still, always have something to do. And then you just naturally do something. And thank God your stage partner realize what you're going for, or what you're doing. And, I hate to use the cliche yes and it and just went with it. It's like, okay, you're standing here holding a drink. Oh, I'm I'm gonna i I'm gonna give you yeah. the opportunity to heighten this by saying you're having a drink. Yes, in this sexual situation about to jump out of play. Of course I'm gonna have a drink. Fi- yeah. uh, ha- hands uh, hands all uh, hands congratulations to you and your partner for being able to work together enough to be able to heighten that scene to what it needed to be. Right. You know, re- it, re- that kind of stuff to me is always really fun. Uh we did a scene years ago at the ice house and we, you know, we had a box of costumes and props and stuff. And I remember one of the, uh, one of the setups was it was me and another actress and we were in a haunted house and, you know, you're walking around the haunted house and you're pointing out things obviously that don't exist. And for some reason in the box was a rubber chicken. And one of the other actors thought it would, thought it would be of funny course. and throws the rubber chicken across the stage. <laughs> and I'd forgotten this line, but she said, I've always remembered your line. You pointed up and you go, Oh, look, a poultry geist. And <laughs> yeah, it was just one of those things where it's like, wow, I, I don't, I didn't remember that. Years later, she mentioned that line to me. I was like, I, I didn't remember that line, but it was like, yeah, I was, I guess that was a good line. <laughs> just in the moment, poultry guys. Yeah. Oh man. So let me ask you this, looking over your history, did you start in the industry as a writer or did you start in comedy or stand up first? Well, I was always a writer. I, I mean, I came out of high school as I wrote a newspaper staff. I did a lot of creative writing in college. I did a lot of that. And um, so I, I sort of knew I wanted to write and I always thought, okay, can I, can I write? To, and, and then that'll support my ability to do stand up. And then at a certain point, uh, my first actual writing gig was I'd worked at Hanna-Barbera and a bunch of people from Hanna-Barbera left to go to uh, Universal and start uh, Universal Family Entertainment, a division at Universal. And that was my first actual staff writing gig. And so it just got to the point where I was like, for a while, I was still doing the improv. And then I just got I got so busy writing. that It was like I just continued with the writing and that 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 became a career. I, you know, I've sort of return to stand up now that I'm older. And I, I feel like I, I have those muscles that you don't have when you're younger, where you can say, Hey, you don't laugh at my jokes. I don't really care. Right. You know, I, I think when you're younger, you're so, you know, you live and die by how you do that by that set that night and how you do. And if somebody, if you don't get a good audience reaction, or if somebody, you know, heckles you, or if you, you know, you just feel unfunny or your jokes don't land. I, 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 you know, I, I know for me as a younger person, it really affected me and it really made me go like, eh. and now right now it's like, eh, OK, fine. You don't like it. You don't like it. I'm doing this. You know, I think by by writing material that I I find funny and it pleases me, I'm going to find other people that find it funny, too. You know, I think you, you're going to find I, I I recently saw an interview with uh, Lee Childs, the, the writer of the um, uh, Jack Reacher novels. And he said the key was write books that you enjoy. And hopefully you find twenty to 30,000 people every year that want to read that book because then you break even. Anything over that is gravy. And and I thought it was an interesting take that he, you know, he goes, mainly I write these books because I enjoy them. And I, I was like, wow, that's that's a sort of a fascinating take and a great way to apply sort of how, how I see, you know, comedy on stage now. Am I enjoying it? Am I having fun? But the But the writing actually supplanted doing other stuff because, as you know, very hard to make money as a stand-up, especially now there's a ton of people out there doing it. I feel like some of these clubs are clogged with a, a, 
a lot of people that can work social media but can't necessarily write a joke. Um, and, mm-hmm. and you know, writing was always a solid paycheck, especially television writing. You know, movie writing is its own other thing. You know, there's maybe a handful of guys that can make an actual living writing movies or specking movies or being paid to rewrite movies. But television, right, you need a lot. You need a lot of stuff, right? You need you and you need to deliver scripts every week. So television has has been really good. Also, I've written video games and I've had a lot of fun writing video games because I'm a gamer. So I've had a lot of fun doing that, too. Well, I, I'm going to get into the deep dive of the difference between TV writing and, and video game writing in a minute. But I want to know. So fresh out of high school, you get a job writing for a newspaper. You do this. What? How do you become a t- how did you become a TV writer? Because to me, all these mediums are such different places, different, different types of writing, like writing. Like, like I write for a newspaper and I say that in finger quotes, right. because what I do is I record an interview with another comedian. I have an AI transcribe it. I give it to my editor who uh, spell checks it and then they print it. And send me a check. I feel like I'm robbing a nonprofit <laughs> yeah. is what I feel like. Yeah, it's... But I don't write, I can't write long form. I, it's all Q&A style, you know, and I, I, I've i tried, I have a couple articles that are long form writing, long form interview yeah. writing, uh, but I know that's so different, like, and I've tried writing sketch scripts and TV, I, I'm, I'm tr- still been trying, since the pandemic, I've been trying to write a TV pilot, and I'm like halfway through, and all of it's such different versions of writing, what, what made you think that you could... Now I said, what, what made you think you could be a TV uh, writer? That's not, but it's like, yeah. if you're writing one thing, how did you get the job as a TV well, writer? What so, made you, you want know, to go to work at Hanna-Barbera? Well, when I started at Hanna-Barbera, I was in the publicity department. So I started doing publicity and okay. that's a related skill because publicity is like, publicity is like newspaper feature writing, except you're trying to sell something, you know? So yeah. publicity and marketing, they're very much related. So in the publicity department, I would do stuff like I'd write an article about June Foray, who was... Uh, you know, had done many voices in Hanna Barbera, but is most famous for being, uh, you know, Rocky the Flying Squirrel from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, and so I'd go to lunch and I'd interview her and I'd write an article about, you know, June Foray comes from a small town or whatever. I, I, I'd, I'd update their bios. I'd do that kind of stuff. I would write. I remember one time writing an article for Television Guide and it didn't get my my name wasn't on the byline. It was Mr. Hanna's name on the byline, but it was about uh, bedrock and and how the the sort of enduring popularity of the Flintstones. And then it was about like, well, what modern stars would appear on the Flintstones if you could do it today? And that's where you ended up with like, like the fun of me to that was I got to come up with them. Well, of course we'd have Arnold Kortzenegger on, you know, the, the Flintstones today, right? You know, you're coming up with those modern crazy, you know, way, way you do that. And so it was sort of, the, the nice thing was I was, I was here in town. So I sort of read about, you know, I, I took classes at UCLA. I took extension courses in writing uh, screenplays and in writing television. And really then I had a writing partner and we worked together at Hanna-Barbera in the publicity department. And we started getting together in evenings and weekends writing spec scripts. So we were able to get like, you know, actual produced scripts from shows like Miami Vice and the original Equalizer. Uh, and we were able to look at what's the format of the script. You know, how long are they? How are they formatted? And then, you know, the earlier script writing programs, then we'd sit down and we'd literally, you know, we were both working day jobs, but then you're, you're spending, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week writing scripts, you know, coming up with a story. You know, what would be a funny uh, version of Miami Vice? What would be, or not funny, but what would be a good story to tell on in Miami Vice? Style? What would be a, a funny story to tell uh, for the Equalizer? I remember the Equalizer story we came up with was, The Equalizer opens a newspaper one day and, you know, his bit was he had an ad in the newspaper. Do you need help? You know, do you need someone to be your Equalizer or whatever? He got all his ads through the newspaper, which is so old fashioned nowadays. But uh, (laughs) our premise was that we had a guy in our office who thought he was like a badass and he was like like a wheezy asthmatic guy, you know, who drove a Ford Tempo. And we we our premise was what if that guy put an ad in the newspaper above the Equalizers saying, I'm the real equalizer. I'm the guy that's going to help you out. And then he gets in such trouble because he's really, a, you know, a wheezing asthmatic that the equalizer has to come in and help this guy who's stolen his his ad. Right. And so that was the premise. It was, And we then we sat down, we wrote the spec scripts. We, we wrote all these spec scripts. We ended up getting an agent and we went out and pitched on shows. And then she ended up getting married and moving out of town and, and pursuing other things. 
But I started then getting work writing scripts at Hanna-Barbera. They started get, getting to know me that I could write and I was funny. And so a lot of it was not only had I worked on my skill set for writing, but then it was, you know, who I knew. I knew people around the studio and they know that Mark's pretty funny and that publicity guy. And so that's how I ended up then writing actual scripts. You know, I'd already had experience on my own, you know, doing it and researching it. And I remember, too, we had in college, we had a guy come to uh, speak who was a television writer. He'd written for Six Million Dollar Man. He'd written for... I want to say MacGyver, a bunch of stuff. And how he started as a writer was he was a pilot of a B-52 for Strategic Air Command. And he said back in the 60s and 70s, he goes, you'd sit in these ready rooms for hours waiting for the alarm to ring and you go jump in your plane and you fly off to bomb Russia, right? And he said, I I was able to get through a friend a couple of scripts and I saw the format of it. And he sat down and spec scripts on an old typewriter in the ready room of a strategic air command base. And that's how he got his start. Right. But it all started with just <laughs> right. Sitting, sitting down, looking at the scripts, reading the scripts. You got to, you got to read a lot of scripts because you have to know. The f- I just love the thought of him just being, yeah. you know, sitting at the typewriter, trying to figure something out. The alarm goes off. He gets in the plane, he's flying. And he's like, Oh, I know how to resolve this storyline. And then he's writing a notebook as he's hitting the bomb button. I know. Drop Can the you bomb imagine? Button. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that would have been a great story. But now the world's ending. Yeah. Um, he, <laughs> you know, like for us, all our good ideas come in the showers. His comes while doing, committing genocide. Right. Right. But a lot of it, too, is like if, you know, like with Miami Vice, I remember watching episodes of Miami Vice and literally sitting down and, and writing down uh, ex- exterior Miami day uh, this in this scene, Crockett and Tubbs go blah, blah, blah. And then I, I actually would break it down. And when you do that for several episodes of a television show, you see the format becomes clear to you, right? How many scenes there are, how many, you know, and what was interesting about Miami vices in the day was those scripts were, were shorter for hour long scripts. They were usually 45 pages or so uh, rather than a standard closer to 60, because if you ever watch the old Miami vice, they end, they don't have any denouement. There's no end of the script. They just end right at the climax. Crockett shoots the bad guy and there's cool music. And that that's that's the end. Frequently, that's how they ended. And they also mm-hmm. left room for like whatever, you know, musical montage there would be. Right. Because they threw in all those musical yes. montages. So you had to make your 80s action, mo- action TV series. montage. Exactly. Needed. So you had to make the scripts, you know, shorter. So it was, uh, you know, it so it required a lot of like extra work. You know, it, it, it like people think, oh, you just sort of you sort of did it. No, there's actually a lot of study that goes into it, you know. And the nice thing now is I used to there was a place in Hollywood. There was a bookstore in Hollywood where I would go down and they would have piles of old scripts. So I spec'd a night court one time and I went and bought a copy of a night court so I could see, OK, how do they do that? Where are they breaking their acts? You know, what are they doing with that? Now you can get a lot of that online, whereas before you'd have to find a specific place to sell it. You know, so that you could you could get it. Now you now you can you can just buy those stuff. A lot of times you can buy buy produce scripts off eBay, so you know what they look like. And a lot of times you don't even have to buy you you can just find a formatted script, you know, through using Final Draft or whatnot. You know, and yeah, I mean, there's also tons of resources of scripts, just free archives online right. of PDFs of scripts that you can just exactly peruse through it at, at your at your leisure. Yeah, it's. It's interesting. I'm always fascinated to listen to how somebody be- gets into the TV writing gig because I listen to a podcast called the Nerdist. Well, it's not no longer the writer Nerdist, but it's the Writers Panel podcast with Ben Blacker, and that is one of the things that they talk about a lot. Is every person who gets into the writing of TVs, their way into the business is completely different than everyone else. Right. Nobody has the same journey into it. Uh, so it's inter- I'm always fascinated to hear how did somebody get it in because. A lot of it is like right place, right time, working hard and hard and hard, being an assistant in right. your case, go working in the in, in the product, you know, the, the PR department. Right. And then just like, hey, by the way, here's a script, which is interesting and, and, and enlightening to he- or is uh, uh, good to hear that you went into one department and then was able to transition over into writing, because in my experience with a lot of jobs, if you do a job. That is not what you want to do. They're only ever going to see you as that one job. Example, my my experience in radio, uh, when I started in the radio industry, I end up quickly falling into the engineering department because more hours, more money, and I got to do cooler things. Yeah. 
but I always wanted to be on air. So when I would turn in air checks or audition tapes to PDs, they would like, hey, I'm really impressed. It shows you know what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm asking you yeah. <laughs> to yeah. put me on air because I know what I'm doing. But in their mind, it's like, I just see you as an engineer. Well, I didn't realize that you also had this other the skill ability set. Yeah. to be such a good on air on air talent. Yeah. You know, like one one boss said, uh, you don't make any of the mistakes that new people make. I was like, that's because I've been doing this for 18 years, George. Right. Like, right. Well, you know, I'm not new. the other nice thing for me in starting in publicity was I got to meet you know, people across the, the spectrum of the studio, I got to understand the entire production process before I even started being a writer, right? Because I was I was doing press primarily for voice actors, but also actual actors, because in, in that in that day it was just the start of like celebrities coming in. So like I remember working I worked with Tim Matheson. I remember working with Jonathan Winters. I got to meet Jonathan Winters. I got to share a uh a uh, limousine ride to uh, we had a, a radio show here on KLOS, Mark and Brian and Jonathan Winter. They want to interview Jonathan Winter. So I got to share a limo ride with Jonathan Winters, hearing his funny, crazy stories. And but I also got to meet with I got to meet with animation directors. I got to meet with animators. I got to meet with Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera running the studio. I got to go into the editorial department and the background department. I got to actually understand the whole process because I had to write about it and learn about it. And I'd have to also go out and get like, you know, like putting together press kits for the Jetsons movie. I had to go get the slides, the color slides and then black and whites. And right. You sent out, sent out all the press kit. And I remember they had some very early CG backgrounds that were done for that movie. And I remember going and talking to the, you know, the high tech guy at that time talking about, you know, what's the future of CG in movies and stuff. I mean, talk about, hearing weird about that. And I remember at the time he told me, yeah, we don't actually want to animate people because it's so hard to do. And, you know, the, he was the first guy where I heard the term, the uncanny Valley, where he talked about, you know, how people's eye were trained. We see people every day. It's going to be because in the movie they did the, the they did the, uh, the Jetsons house that was on those big uh, hydraulic lifts. And they, they did a scene where it lifted up above the smog and that was all CG. And he said, that's the kind of stuff we're really good at. We're not really good at animating people. And now I look at it and I go like, well, now they figured out the problem of animating people and, you, you yeah. know, creatures. And, you know, you look at that, you know, between now and now Avatar and you're just like, wow. OK, so we're, we're well beyond that. But it was fun. It was an introduction to, to everything. You know, being in PR was an introduction to a lot of stuff. And I felt like I could say like, OK, I, I want to go into the writing. But, you know, if I if I could draw better, I, I you know, I could have used it to go into animation as well. Well, that's a funny thing because your career, when I, when I look, look over your career, uh, you know, the first thing that struck out to me when we met doing Zoom comedy was that, you know, I'm, I'm looking up information about comedians to do introduction. I was like, oh, this dude wrote on all my favorite shows as a kid. Yeah. So that has been like you started at Hanna-Barbera, which is obviously a kids cartoon network. Uh, but then you've gone on to write w literally one of my favorite shows of all time, Spider-Man, the animated series. It's really fun. I, I, I could spend an entire day just asking you questions about that show itself. But you've done a lot of comic book shows, Power Rangers, Lego. Uh, it often seems when you look at your 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 IMDb, it's mostly Spider-Man, Lego, and then a little bit of everything else sprinkled in. Uh, is that. First off. Are, uh, did you get into comic book writing uh, because you're a comic book fan or was that just by happenstance? Uh, both, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm a comic book fan. I was actually my, my favorite was always Iron Man. I was always a big Iron Man fan, uh, mm -hmm. but I was a Marvel kid. Right. Uh, I, you know, okay. I was a silk. Yeah, because you're about the age. You're like the gold. You're, silver you're somebody age who probably grew up in the go silver yeah, age. Yeah. yeah. Silver age comics a era age where it's like, yeah, of course I grew up with comic books because we had nothing else in the world. But comic here's books. what was. So now you get to here, the age of an yeah. adult. You're like, I'm going to be in a comic book. Here's guy. what was yeah. weird about that is I grew up in Honolulu. And so I, I would spend summers with my relatives in the Midwest doing, as my mom termed it, character building farm labor. Um, <laughs> I, she'd been a farm girl in Iowa and I, you know, I got to be about 16. I'm like, do I have enough character now? She's like, yeah, you don't have enough money to save for college yet though. So, um, and doing stuff like jobs that I don't think exist anymore, like walking beans and detasseling corn and bailing hay, that kind of stuff. Um, but I would, I would go to you know, a lot of times frequently they would have those comic book racks and in, in, you know, grocery stores or in, uh, you know, like a, a dime store in the Midwest. They had all these dime stores 
or hardware stores and I'd buy them. And I I remember frequently I get to read like I remember distinctly they had a, a Marvel team ups with it was Spider-Man and Iron Man. And they were battling a, a villain called the Wraith. And I got to read parts one and two. And then I went back to Hawaii. And because of the way the comics were delayed, I I didn't get to see part three of that comic. Now, here's a funny story about that. <laughs> My freshman year of college, I had a roommate who um, uh, took me back with because I lived in Hawaii. I, I didn't go back for like, you know, uh, Thanksgiving break. So I went with him to his house in Phoenix and we wandered into a comic book store and I found the third installment of that book, the final but in a comic book shop in a box. And I was finally able to read it. You know, I had to wait. <laughs> you know, I had to wait like eight years from 10 till I was 18 <laughs> to read the conclusion of that that comic book. But yeah, I, you know, it, it's been really fun. Yeah, there's definitely I've definitely uh, the only way I finally finished the uh of Carnage series, uh, the Spider-Man Carnage series was because I bought the 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 Com- trade paperback yeah, the compendium, of the yeah, yeah, series. yeah, yeah, the compendium of it. Because I definitely have still uh, every time I go to a comic book convention, I write down a list of what series am I missing ones from just to find them and see if I can find them at decent prices. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, well, see, my first comic books came from uh, a, a, just a comic book rack at a Seven Eleven, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was hit. You know, I was buying literally Slurpees, Bazooka Joe and and Marvel comic books at a 7-Eleven on my way home from middle school. And it, it was just hit or miss what comic books would get delivered to that 7-Eleven. It wasn't until I was almost in high school that I finally found comic book shops, actual comic right. book shops where I can you get whatever you want. Have yeah. Things. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I can't. And that's, by the way, Baltimore, where it's like a major metropolitan city. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like grow up in Honolulu when occasionally a boat might show up with stuff for the Some comics books. Exactly. So but it ended up being, you know, here's what's weird. I've had a, I've had a really varied career as far as I, I've I've written, you know, like comic book based stuff. I've also written a lot of uh, uh, preschool entertainment, because when my kids were little, I started getting into like you know, okay, early education, how do you trank it? So I've done stuff like, there was an early series I did called uh, Dragon Tales, which was a PBS series. I worked on a show for Disney called Jojo Circus. And then I did a show, a kid's movement show for a Henson called Animal Jam, which was really fun because it was actually a puppet show, right? It was, it was, it was. You worked with Henson? Yeah, it was a live action puppet show called Animal Jam. Oh, and wow. what was fun about that is we got to write songs. So we got to uh, suggest song lyrics. There was a song every episode, and that was really fun, too. And the other time I got to suggest doing songs was uh, back in the day, Klasky Shupo made a series called Santa Begito, and it was a town full of bugs. And Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo did did the music on that series. And so what was trippy is I got to suggest a music or, or songs, and he he would set them to music. And so it's like it feels... I mean, talk about a trippy, weird. Here's the, I'll tell you one quick, weird story about Santa Begito. So Santa Begito, it was a town full of bugs. And it was mainly about the <laughs> two. Uh, there was a uh, a male and a female ant that sort of ran this town. And, and they had a little, uh, they had a little um, uh, restaurant that they ran, but it was all bugs in the town. But they had all these famous people working on the show. Um, uh uh, Cheech Marin worked on the sh- on the show, and one of the oh, most famous ooh. gets on the show was George Kennedy, famed Academy Award winning actor George Kennedy was on the show playing Ralph the Ladybug, a ladybug who has <laughs> given up eating other bugs. He's become you know uh, like a hippie bug, and I did an episode, and it was George Kennedy, and they had a thing where the 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 mom the mama ant got sick. And she broke one of her antenna and they had to all pitch in and do her job. And of course, the joke there is then you realize, like, she does so much in a day that nobody can keep up, you know, because ants are drinking sugar water. So they're going crazy. But they have to watch all the young pupa, right? All the young insects. And I had him and another character watching all these insects. And I just wrote a scene where Ralph the Ladybug, played by George Kennedy, is sitting there and he's just feeding eggs into a young pupa's mouth. And this other guy character comes up and goes, Hey, hey man, what are you doing? Oh, my boy Luke here can eat them forty eggs, and it's, and it, 
I stole a line from Cool Hand Luke <laughs> that George Kennedy was known, known for, right? And here's what's great. I got to go to the recording. I got to see George Kennedy do the line. And he did the line. goes, my boy Luke here can eat them 40 eggs. And then they say cut. And he goes, ha, ha, I get that. I get it, right? And he was very gracious. <laughs> he shook my hand afterwards. And I told him, I said, you know, if, if we get another season of the show, I'm going to find a way to have Ralph the Ladybug back a 707 out of a snowbank because – my memory of him as the engineer <laughs> in the old, uh, you know, airport movie, you know, was like, yeah, he backed that out of the, you know, he just give it more engine, you know. And uh, it, to me, I look back on times like that when I've had, you, you know, got to interact with, you know, he, he was in his later years then, but he liked to do voiceovers because it was easy. You came in and you did the voiceovers and stuff like that. But I remember afterwards, I thought like, how many great movies from my childhood has that guy been in? You know, ten speed and and brown shoot. You know, um, no, not ten speed. Brown, uh, uh, um, um, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Uh, you know, the Dirty Dozen. Yep. Um, you, you know, Airport. Cool Hand Luke. I mean, he's been in so many great films, and I'm like, this guy's now voicing a voicing a ladybug. <laughs> right? It was just weird. It was weird to me. But it was fun. Well, and that's one of the things that I love about that you can get away with children's animation is tiny little Easter eggs, as we would call it now. Right. Like that where it's like, oh, he's here's the guy from Cool Hand Luke doing his line from Cool Hand Luke in a children's cartoon, which will fly over the heads of kids. Right. But is going to be like, hey, wait a second. I know what that is for the parents who have to watch a lot. I always like throwing a bone to the parents because I was a parent watching these kids. Like, that's why, you know, my kids and I still talk about SpongeBob because there are episodes of SpongeBob that we watched. You know, I, there's a great episode of SpongeBob called The Magic Conch, and it's basically a take on a magic eight ball, right? And they they spend the whole episode just doing what the magic conch tells them to do. You know, magic conch, what should we do? Nothing. And they sit and do nothing. And, and of course, Squidward, <laughs> it drives Squidward bananas that they're listening to this stupid mystical object, right? And, you know, to me, it was always fun when they, they mixed in stuff. So uh, on my Lego show, Nexo Nights, in the first season, every episode has a line from Monty Python hidden in it. Uh, nice. Yeah, and here's the weird thing about that: some guy from Germany who like reviews Lego shows, like watched the episodes, and he caught it. Now he's an adult reviewing these Lego shows, right? And he he caught the references to Monty Python. It's like, wow, that's a that's a what a weird world we live in now. That some guy in Germany is now, you know, doing the reviews on like his you know YouTube channel, and he he caught that we did that because I was like, I'm just hoping some you know somebody will catch it. But it was it was pretty funny that he caught it. I feel like that's one of the things you catch only on binge watching. Like if you're watching it sporadically every once in a while, you're not going to notice it. But if you watch them back to back to back, you're like, Hey, I'm starting to notice a theme here. Right. right exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I've been, you know, I've been very fortunate too. you know, several times in my career, I got to work with Stan Lee, which was really, really fun. And, you know, really. In I was going to ask you uh, how, so far, like you've mentioned a lot of uh, people that uh, like that are your heroes, some of my heroes. And you mentioned Stan Lee, which is like, but uh, I mean, when you worked with him on the, the, the early 90s animated series, he wasn't the Stan Lee that we know now. Like he would like he did like some narration on cartoons. He I don't think he appeared in Mallrats yet. He, he did. He appeared as what a juror in the uh, trial of the Incredible Hulk, like. He wasn't the Stan Lee. Well, right. Be like only comic book people knew this Stan Lee. By well, then. and and at that point in time, you have to remember that was in a period of time where Marvel was going through bankruptcy. Right. So Marvel was bankrupt. And I look back at that time and I'm like, I should have foregone having them pay me cash. They should have just given me Marvel stock. And then I never would have had to work again in my <laughs> life. Right. From that point where it was worthless. But remember, that was the time where they had started cranking out. You know, like they had like six or seven different versions of Spider-Man. And so like you couldn't keep up with like, are you following Spectacular, Amazing, you know, uh, Spider-Man, uh, you know, 2099, what version are you following? And so they were really spinning their wheels. But, you know, that series, the Spider-Man series, the first season, like the first 10, 12 episodes, we were actually in the room with Stan and we would actually sit and break stories we'd have sometimes these six, eight hour story sessions where you sit in a room with Stan and, you know, the producer and the guy who was buying Marvel at the time, then Avi Arad, who was buying it for a toy biz toy company that he owned. So that's why there were also so many toys cranked out. 
from that series was because he was, you know, looking at it in terms of, okay, we're going to use this to sell action figures. And, um, so Stan, and, I mean, that worked throughout all of the eighties, that, right. that business model worked right. throughout all the eighties. And so, but Stan, you know, it was, it was so interesting to be in a room with Stan because you realize like, First of all, two things I realized. Here's one thing I realized. So one day I got to, you know, I was I was only I think 26 at the time, and I and I wanted to ask him a question about. Um, I, I I said to him, I said, uh, I said, you know, Stan, it was I I it was the Craven the Hunter episode. I wrote the first Craven the Hunter episode, and I said, you know, Stan, you 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 called him Craven the Hunter, but you know, Craven meets cowardly. How did you come up with that? And he goes, Yeah, Mark, but I spelled it with a K. <laughs> right and, and you realize another, another story i asked him once i said you know uh, you know originally on in the comic series you ran the hulk the hulk was gray and then he changed to green right and there's been a whole lot of like lore about that and now you know the gray hulk's the smart hulk and the green hulk right there's a lot of how did that come about and he said well the, the print shop guy comes up one day he says hey we're having trouble registering the gray I said, well, what are the colors you got? He said, we got green. I said, okay. <laughs> and you realize like, well, back in the day, it was also just a job and he was the only writer there. So sometimes on a Friday, right? Stuff just needed to get done. Craven. How about we call him Craven? You know, and <laughs> there you go, right? Just write it in. It's easy to spell. It's it's alliterative. It's, it's cool sounding, you know? And so, I, you know, you realize that like you imbue everything now with all this lore. And so much of it back then was, you know, they were just cranking out pulp publications to, you know, they had a deadline, they had to get it done. Um, but Stan was also that sort of, you know, World War II, great, you uh, know, great uh, depression era guy. So he was just happy to be working. He was just happy to still be working. Yeah. He was, you know, he was still sort of the, you know, the godfather of Marvel. And so he had an office there in the building and he was still working. And you know, they just wanted him around because he was a compendium of all Marvel knowledge, basically. And a uh, very funny story. Yeah, it's yeah. easy to remember the entire universe when you create the entire universe. Right. And, you know, the, it, here's a very funny story. So the the, the writer producer uh, of um, Spider-Man, the animated series, John Semper, uh, who was kind enough to hire me and put me on staff. You know, I remember one day he proposed, you know, I want to do what Stan originally did in the comics. And that's tell multiple stories, you know, each episode. And our scripts were very, very involved for what was normally an animated script. Yeah. Normally you wouldn't be telling that many stories. And towards the end seasons, they let us, they sort of, you know, I felt like we were with adult, without adult supervision. So we were doing multiple story arcs and multiple episodes, stuff that's common now. But back in that day, everybody, they wanted everything to be episodic. You know, and we were then started yeah. doing these multiple. Uh, yeah, with, with Spider-Man, the animated series and X-Men, those yeah. serialized series yeah. meant everything to me because the, the stories were denser. They were realer. I felt I empathized more with the characters. I was more invested in their stories. Batman, the animated series is great and wonderful, but I I never loved it as much as I did the Marvel stuff. I've always been a Marvel guy. But when I watch those Marvel animated series, it's like we're we're telling not just a story every week. We're telling of the lives of these people. Right. Like I loved how episodes carried out over multiple seats. Like when Mary Jane fell into the, to the negative zone or where it was yeah. that she disappeared into and was gone. That was in the middle of a season. I, they didn't resolve that until the other season. I went as a child. I went two years without wondering what's trying happening. To figure yeah. out what happened to Mary Jane? Well, like, and how do you do that? We don't do that today on live action series where we leave that big of a cliffhanger for so long. But they did that to me as a kid in the 90s. It was insane. Well, here's what's funny. So John Semper is uh, is actually he's a Boston guy. He's from Boston. He's a Harvard University graduate, but he grew up in Boston and uh, he um. He was a comic book reader, so he was a fan of this. So I remember he he said, "I want to do it. I want to do it uh, like that. I want to tell the stories like that." And the example he used for uh, you know those of us who maybe couldn't relate at the time, he said, "He goes, you know, like Seinfeld. The way Seinfeld, each character has an arc to the episode, but they might, might they might continue through multiple. You know, they'll reference it and right." And so the here was the weird thing: the big sell was at one point in time, Stan had sort of bought the Kool Aid that the the network wanted, we just wanted episodic, episodic. 
And Stan came in to John's office one day and he goes, I, I watched that Seinfeld show. And wow, they do a plot here and a plot there. There's a lot going on. That's great. That's what that's what we should do. I wonder where they came up with that. And John looked at Stan and goes, where they came up with that? Stan, they come up with that from you, right? You were always doing that. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's how that's how you wrote stuff back in the day. You know, I'm I'm stealing from the source and you're the source, right? And <laughs> and and so that's how we sort of got to to do that. And so in the later seasons, yeah, we were doing multiple story arcs. I remember working on the Daredevil story arc, which was really fun. And in a lot of cases, We'd sit around in story meetings and you'd come up with the arc of the story and then you'd break it down into what will the individual episodes be and say this five episode arc. And then I think, is it the third or fourth season? John gave the whole season a subtitle, Neogenic Nightmare, right? Because we had, you know, and yeah. Morbius the Vampire and all this stuff. And, and of course, that was really weird, too, because a kid's show with a vampire. Um, do you, I, I learned. I, uh, so BSNP, he couldn't we couldn't show any blood. We couldn't show him biting anybody. Right. He can't, you know, he can't be a creature that. Yeah, he had the he suckers, had suckers on, his, on hand. his hands that suck plasma. And then it was while that was going on, I realized like, oh, that explains the salt vampire in in uh, the first season of Star Trek. Remember, there was a salt vampire that would suck the salt out of people, but appeared, appeared to be a beautiful <laughs> woman. And I realized, oh, that came about because BSNP said, well, it can't be an actual vampire, can't be biting, we can't show blood, that's horrible. So it became suckers on the hand and sucking salt out of people. <laughs> I always thought that was weird as a kid. I was right. like, all right, and I, like just grabbing somebody in the arm and like, all right, I'm sucking out all your plasma from your forearm. Oh, right, yeah, makes, like that was always so a little dumb, bit weird right? to me. But it's, but it also, <laughs> you know, that was, you know, when you had, and, and now they don't have as much of that broadcast standard and practice, right? You, you, I think now if we'd done a Spider-Man version, you could probably have them as a vampire, right? So long as you didn't show blood, you know, gushing out everywhere, but it's, yeah, back in the day, that was a re- that was a thing, and that was a, one of the reasons why we couldn't uh, do certain characters, um, uh, you know, that had like fire involved. We couldn't, we couldn't, like in that in that Daredevil multiple arc with Spider Man and and Matt Murdock. There's a big fire in the factory, and we had to make sure that they were not too close to the flames. So stuff like that, or or if we did things with like fire, could we make the flames? blue rather than look like real fire so we could say it's oh it's some magical fire or something you know mystical yeah I, fire. yeah uh i i recently interviewed uh, a musician named joe sib he used to be in a band called wax uh and they are if you remember them their music video was one of spike jones's first music videos and it's just their song playing while a stuntman on fire runs down the street in slow motion. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. guy's band. Like, And he talked about that MTV. It's the first music video on MTV that had a warning, don't try this right. at home. Right. Because they were afraid. They were terrified that somebody's going to watch Beavis and Butthead, see this music video, and then light themselves on fire and run down the street. Yeah, that's why we couldn't do, um, uh, uh, why is his name? Escape? Hell Rider. Uh Oh, Ghost, Ghost Rider. Rider. We couldn't do Ghost Rider because he's a flaming skull. And yeah, we get notes from BSMP like, we're afraid kids will light their face on fire and ride their big wheel down the <laughs> down the driveway. And it's like, really? You know, maybe, maybe we should let those kids do that. But uh, that's terrible. I don't mean that. Um, but yeah, it's... Well, it's like we're, we're giving these incredibly convoluted stories, but we don't think they're not smart enough to not light their heads on fire. Like it's... Right. We, we trust they can understand well, these serialized so- shows, but you know what? They probably are just going to get distracted and mesmerized there by There was fire. a lot of people have forgotten this, but one in, in I think it was either right after I left Hanna-Barbera or right before I came to Hanna-Barbera, there was a version of Scooby-Doo called The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo and it yes, started Vincent Price. With Vincent Price. And there was a scandal when mm-hmm. a family sued the network, I believe, because they thought, and I don't remember the exact parameters of this, but they thought there was an, 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 a, like a shadow shown on a wall of a guy hanging himself in that in that Ugh. cartoon. And they said our, our, our child committed suicide by hanging and had to have gotten the idea from seeing your cartoon. So, oh, oh yeah. So <laughs> that is such a stretch. Right. I, 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 at least I like I would get it was like, hey, my kid watched Wizard of Oz and found the dead guy in the background of the munchkin scenes and then tried it. I would get, I can go along with that. But like a shadow of a hanging man 
from Scooby Doo and the very rarely seen Ghost of uh, Thirteen Ghosts. Right, Come yeah, on. you know, a talking dog. Right, mainly you learn how to eat too much pizza from that show. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there was my son is overweight because he would try to eat like Shaggy. Right, so you know, for the most part, you know, when I say BSNP broadcast standards and practices, they were a, they were a legal sort of a legal arm of the studios, and usually it was a lawyer involved looking over to make sure that you weren't doing anything that was that was actionable or the other word they used was imitatable. Is it imitatable? That's why you, you didn't use real guns or real gunfire. A Batman was actually one of the first Batman, the animated series. They would actually use guns, but it was sort of, you know, he was sort of he was sort of in a 40s, 50s stylized world. You know, so I think that's how they justified that and got away with that, because I was always jealous that they were using real what looked like a real Tommy gun. And we had to use, make sure it's always portrayed as a laser rifle. It's okay. Cause the kid's not. You know, yeah. Right. Some of the laser guns in car- children's cartoons were so hokey. And that's but, why, but that's, uh, they, they, there was a requirement at that time that you not. Uh, so when we did the original episodes with daredevil, they were like, can he, does he, those, those little, those little horns on his helmet. Can, can those be, <laughs> can those be portrayed as ears? We're like, no, no, he's called Daredevil, right? He's not the devil. He's a daredevil. There's a difference. He's not Satan come to earth to steal your soul. He's a daredevil. He does amazing things, right? He sees, jumps off buildings and does a flip and lands okay, and he's blind, right? But it was like they were initially like, well, he's red, right? He's red, and he has a little tiny horns. Okay, well, and so we had to like, the horns had to be smaller, and they had to be set either forward or back. So they didn't look too much like devil horn. I mean, it was a whole, it was a whole thing, the whole thing. Oh man. They would lose their shit. If they, if you ever introduced them to Mephisto. Oh yeah. Oh, but there were, you know, (laughs) here's the other weird thing that when you work on these shows, especially a lot of cartoon related shows, you realize how many like weird legal things there are because in the early days of comics, artists were not paid very well. So in many cases, they not only retained their original artwork, you know, that's why like now when you see like original Jack Kirby stuff, it's incredibly expensive, but you know, they would get their artwork back. And I own several uh, Spider-Man unlimited uh, uh, originals from Mark Bagley, because at the time I was working on Spider-Man unlimited and they were available. I bought them, you know, so those are, those are really cool. But the other thing is then they also retain the rights to some of those characters. So that's why it took so long for Namor to be to come to the screen. Every time I worked on a Marvel project, they're like, can't use Namor. Because I don't know if you know this, but now the rights to Namor are still tied up in litigation between Universal, who apparently owns some of the rights based mm-hmm. on the family of the artist that created Namor. But Marvel claims to own some rights, right? So we, I, yeah. So I worked on several games relating to Marvel and the Marvel Universe, and we could not use Namor. I, we, I was specifically told on more than one occasion, Namor will not appear. Spider-Man the Animated Series, Namor will not appear, right? I mean, it was, and there were other characters at the time that we couldn't use for f- various reasons. Initially, we couldn't use uh, Electro because James Cameron was going to do a Spider-Man movie. We also couldn't. Oh, wow. We couldn't initially use uh, the Sandman. That's why we had to use uh, Hydra Man. We substituted that into a sand into a oh, Sandman wow, story okay. because we couldn't use him. Um, and so, uh, uh, when I did the uh, the video game Spider Man Shattered Dimensions, ah, oh, that's this is an interesting story. Uh, so, when I worked on. Um, I was brought in to, to write for Spider-Man uh, Shattered Dimensions at Activision. And it was really great because I'd come off working on the animated series. And at the time, they had a three-page treatment that was written by a, a very famous uh, writer of Spider-Man, the comic book series. Um, and he'd done a three-page treatment. But then what happened was Marvel had originally the bad guys in that game were supposed to be, uh, it was supposed to be Dormammu. And that the guy that was helping Spider-Man was supposed to be Doctor Strange. And mm-hmm, then of course. they had gotten something had happened with uh, the Marvel film division at that time that they had gotten. Uh, they were trying to make a movie of Doctor Strange and Dormammu was attached to Doctor Strange as like a bad guy. So word came down that, OK, you can't use that in the game anymore. Instead, you're going to have to make it Madam Web and you're going to have to use Mysterio. 
And this famed comic book writer was like, well, I don't know how to make this work. I don't know. I, I don't know how uh, Mysterio's not. A, he doesn't have any powers. He's just an illusion. I, and I don't know how to use Madam. And I was like, dude, write in television, right? You should be writing in television because this happens every week. They tell us you can't use this, can't use that. <laughs> that character's out or this is out, right? And I was like, well, here's how we do it. If Mysterio doesn't have any real powers, we have to have him. He's seeking an object that will give him real powers. And we'll come up with it. I came up with the other. Uh, we'd use the tablet of time in an episode of Spider-Man, the animated series. So I said, it's another version of the tablet of time, the tablet of order and chaos, and it can control dimensions. And in the opening fight, all Mysterio's right. trying to get it and Spider-Man punches it and falls across all these dimensions. And he needs other versions of Spider-Man to go get it because on Spider-Man, the animated series, we'd use different versions of Spider-Man too. So that was really cool to see that now they've, you know, the genesis of that in the series and then in the game Shattered Dimensions has become, you know, sort of the Spider-Verse is really, is really cool to me. But it was also the, the difference, I think, between sometimes when you see comic book guys and when you see television writers. When you're a television writer, you'll often get notes to say, you can't do this. And you're like, well, if I can't do that, that just you just threw out my whole third act. Well, that there's, you know, legal says we don't have the rights to this or you can't do that or you can't have Namor, right? Right. And so... You got you got to figure it you out somehow. Sit down and figure it out, right? And so it ended up being like like to me on Shattered Dimensions. To me, that was like, oh, okay, this is another one of those challenges you got to do. And we ended up using Madam Web and Mysterio, and it worked really, really well. You know, one of the fun, most fun I had in that particular thing was at the end. I said, "Can we have a post credit scene where Spider Ham comes in?" And I had to wait for <laughs> approval on that. And I and I said, and I want Spider Ham to come in and go like, I'm here. Are we ready to go? You know, and he's he's obviously it's all over. The game's <laughs> over. And they said, Yeah, we can do it. And so I hate the Simpsons for ruining Spider Ham. <laughs> the Simpsons ruined Spider Ham. They make every time people see Spider Ham, they're like, Oh, it's Spider Pig. I'm like, it's Spider Ham and Peter Porker. Yeah, exactly. Come on, get with the program. Yeah. <laughs> He's a spider that was bit by a radioactive pig. Well, and then there's, there's <laughs> get it right. There's all those. There, there's there's Captain America cat, and there's uh, um, yep. There's a whole a line frog. of them. Yeah. There's Thor as a frog, right? There's a whole yeah. There's a whole series of them. Uh, I got to do a, a Funko Pop Marvel uh, series, animated series, a couple of years ago. During, oh, during the pan, during the pandemic, and uh, yeah, we got to use all those guys, which was really fun. You know. That's great. Now, as a comic book fan working in the, you know, the adaptation of in comic book intellectual property, besides having to navigate all the rights and legalese yeah. and stuff, is there ever been a moment where you had to do the comic book? Well, actually, like somebody just gets something completely wrong about a character and you're like, he would never do that or his powers are this or the logic, the comic book logic of of a situation like that would never play out because of this, that, whatever. Did you ever have to do a, well, actually in comic book world. Well, you know, I think we made, we made, but we made reference to Morbius, right? So you would say like, well, Morbius is actually a vampire, right? He doesn't suck plasma. He doesn't have suckers on his hands, but that was, you know, right. We wanted to use him. So that, that was, that was how you have to modify that same thing with like blade, the vampire hunter. He can't actually be putting stakes through people's hearts and, chopping off their heads with a samurai sword, right? So you have to come up with, you know, if you want to do it kids' entertainment realm anyway, you have to come up with stuff. But there's also, you know, like you have to sort of say, okay, this is this version of this character. And like, um, so like I also worked on the series uh, Superhero Squad, which is a version of their characters, right? And there's a lot of adult-oriented humor in Superhero Squad. Um, and then I did Lego Marvel Avengers. I did several Lego Marvel properties and that's its own, that's sort of its own version, the Lego Marvel version. Here's a funny story. I did uh, the Lego Marvel special Lego, uh, Lego Marvel Avengers reassembled. And a couple of things I did on that was that was the, that was like the first Lego thing we got to use Ant-Man because the Ant-Man movie was coming out. And I recreated the very famous uh, comic book shot of, of Ant-Man on the arrow with Hawkeye and Hawkeye on that cover about to shoot yes. Ant-Man. And we actually did that in the series. And I said, this is an Easter egg for all those parents who remember the cover of this comic book. Right. But the other thing about that adventures is, you know, we were using, you know, the Lego version of things, in my opinion, having written for a bunch of Lego is it's family friendly snark. Right. So 
you have to be snarky mm-hmm. and you have to be campy. And, you, and to me, it's like, I also want to make it as smart as possible. I don't want to do dumb jokes. I'm not going to do poop jokes. Right. And so like for me, the character I always like was doing crazy stuff with, with Thor because Thor is this weird Shakespearean dude. And so <laughs> in a Lego version of Thor, right, he's even weirder and more Shakespearean. And so I would do these versions of the Thor, you know, where I'd have the, dost thou think, you know, he'd say that. And I'd always get these notes back like, mm, you, you're, you're making Thor a little too ridiculous. I'm like, am I? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, the Norse right. god yeah. who bangs on his cane and turns into a superhero right. that speaks so, Elizabethan English. I'm getting, I'm getting too ridiculous. Right. And so, <laughs> but I had fun with like, they let me do stuff like. In, in that special, they're setting up for a party and Thor is doing stuff like he's making an ice carving using Milnir, right? You know, he's carving a big block of ice <laughs> like the Avengers. Then, like, like they, they bring in a series of meatballs. Oh, 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 the meatballs are for the mm, meatballs are cold. Sounds like a job for Milnir. And he uses, you know, Milnir to reheat the meatballs and then he burns them. I mean, it's ridiculous stuff. And I would always go, like, I don't, we even think that might be too far that he's using, you know his uh, chosen weapon to reheat mini meatballs. And I'm like, is it? This is a Lego special. I, it's a Lego version of Thor. And so fortunately, most of that stuff I got to keep, but you know, some of it I'd go, and I don't remember specific, but some of it I'd go too far. And same thing with like, like I made Ultron a really weird campy version of Ultron in that, but it really worked. And the animation like played into it, you know, it was, it was, it, it worked out really, really fun. And so, it's fun to do those different, those sort of different versions, but you will occasionally get notes where you're like, okay, even though this is a campy version of what can sometimes be a campy character, don't, you can't go too far, right? You'll still be like, eh, that's too far. He's still an Avenger. Okay. I remember getting that note. He's still an Avenger. Keep that in mind. Oh, oh, okay. He's still one of Earth's mightiest heroes. Let him be exactly, mighty. Exactly. And I'd always be like, but it wouldn't. I think I think Iron Man would joke about this. You know, that was always the response. I'm pretty sure Tony Stark would <laughs> say something snarky about that. Was the plan always to work in children's uh, television? No, I just sort of happened into it. It was always, you know, I always intended to, to, to be in, you know, live action and, and you know, doing, you know, like hour long dramatics or uh, sitcom writing is its own thing. I spec some sitcom stuff. Uh, you know, it, it, at the time, it was one of those things where, you know, in sitcoms, it's a lot of room writing, right? So you got to sit in the room and you got to offer up jokes and it's really fast paced. And, and I've worked in rooms, in writing rooms, certain shows uh, on uh, How to Train Your Dragon, the uh, the television show. That was a room written show for the, for the most part. You know, we would come up with the story arcs and we'd contribute a lot to each other's scripts. And then you'd go off and individually write the scripts. There was a lot of room writing that went on in that particular series. And now in, in some animation. Is there not animation, a lot of room writing in children's TV? There's not. There is now. There didn't used to be. And there were exceptions. Really? Spider-Man, the animated series, I thought was an exception. We did a lot, of, a lot of room writing in that. But in a lot of cases, you would maybe have one or two room writing sessions where you just talk about the show in general. And maybe you talk about here's the story you're going to do. You're going to do a lot of it is done. You know, basically, you're in your own house. You're left up to your own devices. Then you turn it in. You get notes from the head writer. You get notes from the network. You do revised drafts. Um, I always and this is still pre-pandemic. Oh yeah, very pre-pandemic. We're talking pre-pandemic, like so pre-pandemic. Right? Wow. See, I've always known TV show writing to be writers' room. I've never known, with the exception of Sorkin. I like think Sorkin's the yeah, only one writes that writes himself, on his yeah. own. But like, I mean, a lot yeah, of it is uh, now. He'll he'll brainstorm. I think a lot of it is now, so that you can yeah, like like you know, I was I've read a lot about the Breaking Bad writers' room and stuff. But I think with shows like that. And, and I think particularly now that we're sort of in a, you know, the golden age of television streaming, I think you need a lot of people in the room just to keep track of stuff. And just so you don't write yourself into a corner or you do something that you you forget we've already covered that or we need to cover that or we need to go here or there. You know, like it fascinated me that on Breaking Bad that last season, I hope, uh, spoiler alert, uh, where he opens <laughs> the trunk and he's got an M60 machine gun, you know, that's from the teaser of the very first episode. They didn't know where they were going with that when they first wrote that, which I find oh, fascinating, yeah. Yeah. right? You know, and it's like, that's why you need also need a lot of minds in the room. He's like, okay, here we go. We started, we got to end with this, right? How do we, how do we make it clever and breaking bad that we set this up? What do we do now? And they might've had some idea yeah. how to do that, right? But 
Yeah. Uh, Here's point Z. How do we get there from point right. A? And, Working backwards. And a lot of it is because now so much of it is now, it used to be episodic. So when you're writing an episodic series, you can have one meeting where you lay out who the main characters are and here's the world they live in and here's what we do. Mm, and, okay. and everybody can go off and sort of write an episode. Now that stuff is so serialized, you, you, you do need room writing because you need people all together sort of going over stuff and checking each other. And you may have like, like early on on Spider-Man, the animated series, John liked me because I could come up with funny Spider-Man stuff to put in his mouth. And that was the advantage. He needs his quips. Right. And the advantage we had there too was he has a mask on. So you just, you don't see his lips moving. You just see the mask moving. So you can add a new line so long as it fits in that little mouth, you know, the time where he's, you can see that he's speaking or he also, you know, the, the nice thing about Peter Parker is he's thinking stuff too. You always sort of hear his conscience talking to him. Yes. Right. So that was also inner a way we could do that, you know, but, but now when you're room writing, a lot of times you'll come up with somebody who's really good at writing for this character or that character. And so you want that person in the room to say, is that how that character would say that? And then nah, no, or there, or, or they've created a guest character that you want to have back. Well, you want that person sort of writing it again, you know, years ago I um, got to work on, they did a reboot of uh, the pink Panther with Matt Frewer as they actually had him speak as Matt Frewer was the, was the pink Panther. Max, had Max Headroom, himself. right. What was fun about that though, was I got to do a lot of the early episodes of the ant and the aardvark. And I don't know if you remember in the early uh, pink Panther cartoons, the ant and the aardvark, it was an aardvark it was always trying to get the ant and the aardvark was Jackie Mason. It wasn't Jackie Mason. It was, it was, uh, it was, um, Byrne, not David Byrne, uh, John, John Byrne, the, the comedian Byrne, who was a, 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 a who's good at doing voices. And he did the aardvark as Jackie Mason and he did the ant as Dean Martin. And so they were quipping <laughs> and always having stuff, you know, and it was like, ant, ant, I need to get you, you know. And I got to write a lot of those because I sort of ha I sort of knew that voice from from watching them as a kid. And I got to have the yeah. fun with like the very first episode I did of that is. The aardvark orders in Uncle Milty's ant farm, right? I don't know if you knew this. When you ordered <laughs> ant farms as a kid, they sent you the ants separately in a little tube of ants. You could, you could populate the ant. So, of course, the premise is he orders an ant farm. It doesn't come with ants. And then the ant comes in a little tube, and the tube is indestructible. He can't get the ant out of the tube, right? And so the whole episode <laughs> is just quips about him. You know, he tries to, he uses a welding torch. He tries to cut it. You know, he tries to blow it up, all that stuff. Um, but... You know, that was fun because I, I sort of became known for that because I sort of really heard those voices in my head. Right. I was like, I was like, oh, we got another ant in the aardvark. She was like, great, because I hear those guys. Right. I know what crazy, stupid, um, you know, is it, was it who's oh John Biner. It was John Biner is his name. OK, yeah. John yeah. Biner. All right, and he did great voices. And I think he was still alive when they did that series and they got him back to redo the, the the Jackie Mason and uh, and Dean Martin, which is sort of a weird, you know, it's kind of a, when, when you go like, wow, that, what a weird choice. But it also it just so worked. It just so worked for that particular setup. Yeah. And it's like the cartoons imitating other legendary actors just makes their legacy like I can write a perfect Peter Laurie character sheerly because of. Warner Brothers, the amount of times they put a Peter Lorre esque right. character in their cartoons. Like, I, I know how to do Peter Lorre long before I ever saw Casablanca. Rick, please, you have to help me, Rick. Right. Yeah. Because, because of Bugs Bunny cartoons. Exactly. And, you know, they same thing with, like, uh, you know, Snagglepuss. Exit, stage left, even. You know, it's <laughs> he was doing Burt Lar, right? You know, a Dawes Butler was doing Burt Lar, you know, and, and, I, I had the great privilege when I was doing press with them. Don Messick, who is both the voice of Astro and Scooby-Doo, would go do these radio interviews. And you know this, right, from being in radio. You, we'd be on the morning drive time thing. You know, the, ah, here we are in the morning zoo. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. And we've got, we've got the guy who did the voice of, and they'd always say, you know, he just does talking dogs, you know, because let's face it, Astro and Scooby-Doo, they're the same. And Don would get like, well, I have to tell you. And Don actually had a deep announcer voice. You know, he was Dr. Benton Quest. That's his regular voice. So he had this yeah. very, very, you know, well, I have to tell you that actually they're two very different voices. You see, Scooby's actually a deep 
uh, chest voice, <laughs> which is very different from Astro because Astro is actually a throat voice. Right, of you, Rorge. So if you understand voices, you'll understand they're very different. And I was always, I'd, always, I'd always be sitting there like, wow, I'm actually watching this happen. He's actually breaking this down scientifically. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I love voiceover work and I would I would sit there and love to listen to him talk about the difference between the two voices, especially when it would put some, you know, uh, Dave and, you know, Dave and the, the Mongo uh, putting them in their place. Yeah. And you're right. Every morning show, zoo show is the same. It's one, it's some dude with a normal name, some dude with a weird yeah. name. And then he always had the sidekick woman who doesn't really say anything other than, ha ha. Oh, boy. Right, right. Like, it's so, yeah, it was, it's so formulaically offensive. It was, the, the other fun I remember, we I took a bunch of voice actors down to um, uh, uh, Mark and Brian again. And one of the guys in there was Frank Welker. And Frank Welker. So Frank Welker ha, is, is one of the unsung heroes of animation. He has done voices on almost every show. If you look up his IMDb. You'll be like, holy mm-hmm. God, I know this guy. I grew up with this guy. Yep. Now, he started as a comedian. Very funny. As a young actor, he was in a lot of the uh, computer war tennis shoes movies that Disney made in the, in the early uh, 60s. Right. He was in the computer war tennis shoes. He was in uh, a couple of those other movies with um, uh, Kurt. Uh, well, I can't think married to Goldie Hawn. Uh, a partner with Goldie Hawn. Sorry. Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. He was in a lot of those early Kurt Russell movies, right? He was one of the gang in the Dune Buggy, right? And then he just mm-hmm. became like, he's Fred and Scooby-Doo. He's a gazillion other voices. Here's the other great thing about Frank Welker. He can do animal. He can imitate animal. He was the monkey yep. in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I remember asking him one time, I'm like, did you actually, did you actually sit in the booth and do Zig Heil as a monkey? He can't. He can't. He's like, yes, I, <laughs> yes, I did. I, <laughs> Right. But he yeah, because right, you can't actually get a monkey to do something. I mean, he's he does monkeys, he does lions, he does tigers, he he's just he does dogs. Yeah. He's been right. If you IMDB him, you'll you'll just you'll go crazy with how many voices he's done. And oh yeah. Uh, get, so we took him down to a radio show, Mark and Brian, and you know being in a radio booth, like in, in the booth, the phone makes a little electronic sound that can't be picked up on the mic, but so that they know the phone is ringing. It's like a little at that time, it was like, or something. It was some little sound. Well, within an instant of being in the booth, Frank could imitate it. And so they go <laughs> off there and Frank would just be sitting there. And I knew he was doing it, but that Mark and Brian didn't know it. And Frank goes, and, 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 and he'd go, and they'd pick up the phone. Hello? And he could do the phone's not ringing. I said, I heard it ring. And he put it down. And they finally caught on. And it was Frank and Don Messick. And I can't remember who else was, was along with us at that time. And, and finally, one of the guys, he hangs up the phone, looks at him because he goes, which one of you guys is doing that? Right. You find they finally figured out <laughs> that somebody was doing it. And Frank just smiled, real big smile. But he's he was just I learned to do my Ronald Reagan impersonation from watching Frank because Frank was so good at doing Ronald Reagan. Well, you know, mommy says that we can't have pets <laughs> in the over office, you know. And so I was like, wow, he's, <laughs> you know, amazing, an amazing mimic. Yeah, I mean, I don't do a lot of character work, but throughout the years, occasionally I'll do some kind of character. And my character is just like, uh, what's it, Maurice uh, Lamar, who says all his characters are just bad impersonations of people he grew up watching. Same thing with me. But my impersonations are bad impersonations of other people's bad impersonations. Like I remember in college, uh, I went to school. uh, I I went the six years, as I like to say, six years to community college and didn't graduate. Uh, And what I went for was uh, at the time, radio production certificate, television production certificate, and then the third broadcast journalism. And I, I was, I, I was everyone's favorite host for the TV shows because I'm yeah, yeah. not afraid of the camera. I've already been acting. I'm already doing stand up here and there. Like my first stand up performance was fourth grade talent show. Like it's been yeah. like, uh, it, it's, and by the way, to talk about Ronald Reagan, my fourth grade talent show stand up set was basically me just stealing a bunch of material, doing impressions, I wrote a few jokes, but one of the stories I told was an old joke story from Ronald Reagan, where he talks about being on the campaign trail and going up to a house, knocking on the door. A guy comes up and he goes, hi, I'm running for you know, political office or whatever this. And the guy goes, I don't know who you are. I'm like, well, you might might remember me. Uh, I'm a very famous actor. And my initials are RR. 
And he gets really excited. And he runs to the door. He goes, Mommy, Mommy, Rory Rogers is at the door. <laughs> like, yeah. I literally, I'm in, I'm in fourth grade stealing jokes from Ronald Reagan. I, I anyway, got elected uh, president of my student body my senior year because I could do Richard Nixon. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I did. Uh, oh, so uh, one of the people asked me to like host their like it, during the classes. We had to do uh, like instructional videos. That was one of our projects. Is we all had to write instructional videos and then do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you had you had to produce it. You had to assign somebody in the class to be the director, tech director, camera ops, master control, audio, and all this. And the two places I got the most through was directing because again. Not afraid right. of anything. I'm I'm j- dive in. Entertainment's my business already. Right. But also was as host. Like people were to- like, like, we want you to host this, but we also want you to direct it. And so he was like, you're funny. I want you. Here's the instructions. It's how to install a hard drive. I don't care if you know how to do it. It's five easy steps. Just make it funny. And I did this. I basically stole Will Sasso's Kenny Rogers impression <laughs> yeah. uh, from Mad TV. And I did his impression of Roy Rogers, uh, like as the characters of my class, just out here. And then I talked like this. And this is when I first learned in in TV. This is why I took to Zoom comedy so I was because of this exact moment. I'm doing the thing. We're doing take after take after take, and I'm starting to get nervous because I'm not hearing any laughter. I'm working really hard at this, yeah. and then I was like, so he comes out of uh, out of things like, all right, cool. We're gonna do one more take. You did great. Uh, make sure when you do. Uh, this take when you do this part of the thing, make sure that you do this part and make sure you tell the same jokes. And I was like, oh, by the way, is any of this funny? Is this working yeah. at all? And and the camera, pop- somebody pops out from the camera, goes, "Yeah, dude, I'm dying over here trying not to laugh." And he goes, "Oh yeah, it's working." And he just opens master control door, and I can hear everybody inside still cracking up laughing. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, cool, yeah, exactly." All right, yeah. that's when I yeah. learned how to be a funny and a funny in a room of silence. In a room of silence, <laughs> exactly. Well, it's also weird. It's like I. Uh, do you ever listen to Harry Shear? It's now a podcast. It was a radio show, a Le Show on Sunday mornings with Harry Shear. No, I haven't, but uh, I will because I love Harry Shear. If you love Harry Shear, he basically reads the news, but he does stuff like he'll do he'll do like Donald Trump leaving messages for Rupert Murdoch, and he'll do all the voices. <laughs> but I learned how to do um, uh, uh, not Peter Jennings, who's hostly a uh, host a newscaster that uh, um, uh, wrote the book Greatest Generation. Um, Dan, uh, 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 Tom Brokaw, and oh yeah, I okay, learned yes. to do Tom. Tom Brokaw, and, and, I'm Tom right, Brokaw. But what you don't realize about doing Tom Brokaw, and I didn't realize it until I listened to Harry Shearer do Tom Brokaw, is Tom Brokaw has a speech impediment and he can't pronounce L's. And so Harry Shearer will be reading the news and he'll go, he'll go like, oh that, uh, and 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 news news of the Islamic world in Islamabad, uh, Tom, and then he'll come in, oh Islamabad, right? He. <laughs> he can't, he swallows the L. So th- then, then I, I always want to, I get into it by then saying like, you know, and now a special NBC news report on the Islamic world from Jalalabad to Islamabad, right? You know, and it's like <laughs> you learn so much from just listening to how those guys do it. And Harry Shearer is great because he drops, he'll do silly songs. He'll do impersonations. He'll, he'll just, he's, and his natural voice is very announcery, right? It's that very mm-hmm. sort of dulcet announcery, but it's just it's it's really fun. You really like it. It's every Sunday morning, the the Le Show podcast. Oh, I have to listen. I have to. I I have so much room. Uh, uh, like by Thursday, I've run out of yeah, podcasts, yeah. so now I have to start adding more podcasts to my queue just to get get through the week of riding around on the yeah. uh, subways here in Boston. Um, Do you think a lot of your work in genre children show has come because you've worked in that format for so long? There's like, oh, we need, we should definitely hire Mark. He already knows who these characters are. Do you think like it's so, worked in your favor that you've been in the business? Some of it has. Yeah. I think there's some of that, you know, the business right now is really, it's, it's radically changing or it's radically, you know, here's the thing. There's been a lot of, mergers and acquisitions in entertainment recently, you know, Disney buying uh, 20th century. Everything. Yeah. Um, Buying Marvel, buying, you know, the people I used to know that worked at Marvel, they've dissolved a lot of those departments, you know, now Warner brothers, discovery buying Warner brothers, Warner brothers, discovery. There's a lot of radical change. I worked on a lot of 
you know, I, I worked on a Batman series. I worked on the Green Lantern. Uh, I've done some work over, you, you know, on the DC side of it too, but that's all right now. That's it's sort of all in flux. Netflix, uh, they've sort of done away with a lot of their animation department right now because people are just sort of, I think it's, I think it's some pandemic hangover. I, I, but I think it's also just sort of like people are now looking at and going like, how do we actually make money off streaming? And it used to be like, for example, Spider-Man, the animated series is, is a, is a good uh, thing to look at. You know, when they initially ordered that series, they ordered 65 episodes. So that took us five years to make. So you know that, okay, we got 65 episodes, we're going to do this. Now they order episodes either in batches of 10, maybe 12, right? And you don't know if you're getting a pickup till they see how well it's done on the air. So it makes it, there's just fewer episodes. Um, Now, some of that might, right? It's like squeezing a balloon, right? So some of it goes into another area. Might we see more stuff getting done on YouTube? Might we see more stuff getting done over here or over there? I'm. It, it's going to be interesting to see. It. It's. I feel like it's affected this end of the business, you know. And it comes and goes in waves, you know. The business always comes and goes in waves. And I think the current wave that has just crested started nine, ten years ago. When I don't know if you remember this, I was working on How to Train Your Dragon at DreamWorks, and Netflix ordered three hundred hours of programming from DreamWorks animated program. I mean, just a oh, wow. that's huge, tremendous in children's, order, in TV, children's that's TV, 600 episodes of TV. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's six to 900 episodes. Right. Of it's TV. crazy. Wow. And so that's why you've seen stuff like all these derivations of how to train your dragon. You've seen boss baby. You've seen the crudes as an animated show. They've, they, you know, they Netflix thought, okay, well, we're going to tie ourselves to a known entity. We need to produce a lot of programming that, you know, that feels like it's sort of ending. And of course, now Netflix is owned by Universal. So again, more mergers and acquisitions. And when that happens, you end up with, there's just fewer, there's there's less development going on. There's people trying to figure out what their territory actually is, what's actually going on. You know, now we've seen them, you know, switch CEOs at Disney again. So that's going to influence different things. I so it's going to be same thing at Warner's with throwing uh, Tim. They threw out the entire Snyderverse and just handed it to Tim Gunn, which right. is like, I mean, t- I mean, Tim Gunn. Oh, talk about somebody who's worked, uh, who's wor- earned what he's right. uh, who has worked for what he has earned. Like he started out as a PA at trauma, just learning story and, cr- you know, having to fight and claw his way through the business right. well- to get to where he is. And that's why his stories are so dense and good and great is because He's had to put in the work to learn how to make them great. Well, and also, you know, sort of like, I think they needed someone like him, you know, to be a Kevin Feige for that world. But it's going to cause mm-hmm. a reset that we're not going to, you know, it's going to take three, four years to see how that resets and how it trickles down to their animated programming, the direct-to-video, their live action, right? They want to tie that all together the way Marvel's done, which makes sense. I get it. Um, but that's, you know, it's going to take time. And so it's... Uh, it's an it's an interesting time sort of seeing, you know, but the entertainment industry is always sort of resetting itself. Right. In the 80s, it was cartoon shows that were linked to toys. And they said, you can't do that anymore. So the 90s came. There was a lot of educational stuff. Right. We're going to make every show has to have some educational element. Now, if you go pitch a show that has an educational element outside of a place like PBS, they're just not going to buy it because they feel like, no, we, we don't want to do that. But there's also been an emphasis now in a lot of like what they call preschool plus. So that's like. Jake and the Neverland Pirates, right? It's like a show that is designed for little kids, but has, um, you know, an adventure element to it. So you could involve what they call a soft bad guy, right? You're going to have a bad guy that's not, not going to suck your blood, but, right, is also going to, you know, steal mm-hmm. the treasure chest or whatever. And the other problem is, like, a lot of the action adventure that's being done is very niche now because a lot of kids, rather than watching an animated program about Spider-Man, they'll go watch... Um, you know, a show on Disney uh, on the Marvel segment of Disney Plus, you know, that's made, you know, they'll watch the Loki show. Right. They'll do stuff like that now. So it's and, uh, you know, uh, has, Hasbro bought out the uh, Power Rangers universe. So that's there's going to be a whole reset to the Power Rangers. Right. So there's there's a lot of resetting. I think we're also coming out of the pandemic still trying to see how that all works. You know that I know that that's affecting gaming, you know, the way I see games work, because. You know, now the problem is uh, on the gaming end of it, you know, they've discovered that you can do most of this from home. So a lot of the the programmers and and producers and people working in games are like, 
why should we come into the office? Right. And, and I, yeah. I, you know, my brother works as a gaming producer and he's like, you know, we're just trying to get people to come into the office two days a, a, a week for meetings. Cause it's so convenient to do meetings that way. But you know, there's, a, there's just been a lot of resetting going on. So it's going to, I'm interested to see what's going to happen. It's weird for me to look back and go like, well, I've been doing this 30 years and I, you always still have to reset for changes. I always feel like, uh, no, I should just sit back and let, let the work come to me and it'll all be, I'm just riding the gravy train and it's never right. You're always climbing the mountain, you know? And I think that's, I, you know, that from doing stand up, right. You're always climbing the mountain. Yep. And I think, one thing Eric Griffin said to me was that as a stand-up, you're always constantly having to prove yourself right. to clubs, to audience, no matter right. what accolades you have, no matter how many times you have been proven to you're funny to somebody else, everyone still wants you to prove that you're funny. Right. And that is very true in in the comedy business yeah. because, hey, I got I, this club's not going to book me just on the w- promise that I'm funny. They have to, you have to prove it every single time. It doesn't matter that I've done, you know, not me. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. hypothetically, you know, speaking Eric Griffin. It doesn't matter that he's toured all the improvs. As soon as he wants to try and start doing um, the funny bones, it doesn't matter that he's done the improvs. Now for the funny bone, he has to prove again. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that is very true. And I guess it's probably similar in TV where it's like, no matter what show you've written on, you still have to prove that you know how to break a story. That you know how to write in character develop a character voice that, or showrunner's voice or or you know know the characters and know the morals to blend into. Well, it. and also I'm working right now. I've been working sort of on doing some more adult animated uh, sitcom type stuff. You know, and and you know, like I have to actually sit down and write the pilot because it's like people don't know me for that. You know, if they've come to see me do a, a stand up set, they know. Oh, okay, well he's he's doing adult com- right. He's you know, he's doing comedy targeted at adults, but his writing has mainly been targeted at kids. So how is that going to translate? Right. And it's like, OK, well, uh, you know, at this point in my career, I go, oh, I shouldn't have to write a pilot. You just buy it. Right. And it's like, no, no, sorry. No, you got to <laughs> sit down and write it. And it's like, you know, that that becomes kind of a, you, you know, that's where that. You know, having to sit down and do it again, like I was doing 30 years ago when I would get home from my day job and sit in my room and write, you know, uh, you know, specking a script for it, you know, uh, um, you know, equalizer or whatever, same kind of thing. Only now it's like, okay, well, this is a project I've had in my head and I grew up in Hawaii and I want to do it. And so I'm just going to have to, you know, I got to sit down and spec it and have it, you know? Now you're, so you started talking about the way the industry is changing Mm -hmm. right now with, with writing. Do you think it's changing because of streaming or do you think it's changing because of the pandemic both. or is it both? Yeah, do you yeah. think that so, like one kind of amplified the change of the, because of the other? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. There's a guy, there's a guy I, uh, I follow. He, he does a thing called chart book. His name is Adam twos. He's an economist. I think he's from Princeton, but he was ag- educated at Oxford and he uses a phrase. I don't think it originated with him, but he uses a phrase that we're living through the age right now of the poly crisis the many crises we're living through and how they sort of all overlap. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a war now and we've got the pandemic and we've got, you know, the streaming wars and we've got all these various things. And it sort of feels like, yeah, we're just sort of in an overlap of all that. I, I was up for doing a show that would have been produced in France, but with Chinese money at last year, right about this time. And I remember it was like, I was like, okay, great. This is going to be the thing. And my agent like gave them a bid and they were like, wow, no problem. We won't mark on the project. And then like a week later, they were like, well, you know, there's another uptick in the pandemic in China and we're not sure how that's going. And so we're going to, we're going to put the project on hold for now. Right. And it's like, yeah, it was one of those things where it looked like this is going to get going. This would be what happens. And then it got put on hold. You know, I was working on a project earlier this year and looked like it was going same thing. And then the streamer they were looking to do it on, they put it on hold and then they were approaching another streaming site. And, you know, that that just didn't happen. And so I I think we're still living through a weird sort of a weird era where we're going to see, you know, what happens. And, and, you know, uh, everything sort of retrenches. Right. And you have to sort of figure out, okay, what what's going to happen and where 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 are we going now? You know.
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. 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 I came in to help, uh, be a supervising producer on, in a writer's room for a kid's show. And they were basically figuring out, uh, how to do, uh, seasons two and three of a show that they were creating. And yeah, so it was for like a month, basically six, seven hours a day on zoom. And I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I can't tell you Dennis, man, it was like when Friday would come, I was like, God, it, it, it's somehow more exhausting than if you came in in person and had to do it. And I can't exactly explain why, but some of it has to do with, I think just the screen time and sitting there and feeling like you're tied in Hello. because you know, when you're in a writer's room, at least you can get up and, you know, go down to the kitchen or you can go, oh, well, let's all head out to lunch. Right. And we'll walk down the street or whatever. Yeah. And now I want to see you guys just on the phone. Like, hey, let's everyone go to lunch. And then you're Zoom lunching. Right. To your own I mean, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> it, it's just it's just it's it's bizarre and it's weird. I it <laughs> definitely has changed the pitching because here's here's what I liked about pitching prior to the pandemic. You, so you would go to whatever, Netflix. I also remember pitching to Legendary Entertainment and you'd go in there and they'd usually leave an hour for the meeting. They'd rack it out an hour. You'd get in there, you'd have the small talk. And then e- even pre-pandemic, I was doing my presentations on PowerPoint. So you hook up your PowerPoint to your laptop and be on their big screen, right? Usually they'd have like a, oh, that's a 72 inch screen. That's great. You'd talk your way through it, right? Well, then it became, uh, I remember having this discussion with my agent. It became like, okay, uh, you're going to have to cut the pitch down to to 20 minutes. I'm like, why? Well, because they're only bracketing now a half hour to do the pitch. So, and here's the other thing. I need you to take as much wording off the slides as possible because now you want them to listen to what you're saying. And if you've even put bullet points on the slide, they're just going li- to, they're going to read it and not hear what you're saying. So now it's become, <laughs> you know, maximum like 15 to 20 slides mainly just visuals, maybe a headline about what you're talking about and you're pitching your way through it. And then you got to leave five, 10 minutes for questions and you're out in a half hour. And it is weird. It's a weird, it's a weird environment because you also get the same kind of thing you get from doing zoom comedy. It's like, are they hating this? Do they like this? Is, is assistant number three who turned off her microphone? Does she get what I'm saying? Is she even paying attention? Cause the mic's off. You can't hear I, I've made a couple of one-liners. I don't know if they're laughing. I can't tell, right? You know, so I started, there was one I was doing, I was pitching a, a version of something that had a bird character and I actually would come on wearing a bird head. I had this big, I'm a Cardinal fan, so I had a big Cardinal rubber head and I would come in wearing the Cardinal head and talk like I was the bird's agent. You know, listen, first of all, he's going to have, you know, it doesn't work for just seed anymore, okay? You know, and no millet. I want to make sure in his trailer he doesn't have any millet. He's he's on a millet-free diet, and uh, you know, I, I at least felt like I'm going to do this because it's visually interesting, you know. And the producers I was working with were like, "Okay, give us a couple minutes, and then come into the Zoom with your bird head on, so that you're a fun surprise." And I feel like having to come up with some of that visual stuff is the way you got to do it now because, yeah, you know. You'll pitch stuff and not get feedback, and you'll be like, "Wow, that felt really great." And you'll hear from me, "Yeah, they passed." Or you'll do something, you're like, <laughs> oh, "I don't know how, I don't know how that worked." And they're like, "Oh no, they want to see the leave bond." Wait, what? Right? You know? It's like, yeah, it's kind of be hard to judge what people's reactions are when they're turn their cameras on, off, mute, when they're just staring. They forget that they're not, you know, like when you're in the room with humans, you just have natural reactions, right, right. unconscious reactions to people in the room. When you're staring at a screen of somebody reacting, you forget that that's a human being live that you're interacting with. It's, right. It's TV. It's not real. Like I get that. And I have heard from other people saying that pitch decks have definitely changed oh. because of zoom. Like it's, it's hard. Like the, yeah, I've heard the, it's less words uh, on a pitch deck now. And I'm like, wow, that is very interesting. Yeah. Um, speaking of differences, what is what's the difference between writing for a TV show and writing for a game show? Game show, a, a video, video game. game. 
because I've heard voice actors talk about the differences. Like they have to go through every hundreds little iteration, yeah, yeah. Hundreds, of hundreds of lines over and over, different ways and stuff like that. Is it writing? Is writing for a video game also that way where it's like we have to come up with so many different permutations of the same story and outcomes? Sometimes you do. So I, I worked on I for um, uh, DreamWorks. I did the Kung Fu Panda Two game and I did the Mega Mind game. And at that time, they wa- they wanted to have variations in the games for each platform. So I had to do like two different versions, sort of two different versions of the game for like. The Xbox, the PlayStation. Uh, I think they were still supporting Game Boy at that time. So it was, uh, I think, did we do a version for the Wii? We didn't do a version for the Wii. Um, but one, maybe one of them we did. Maybe Kung Fu Panda 2 had a version for the Wii. So now you've got to write different, like, you know, it was the same basic story, but you're writing variations on lines because they're changing things subtly. They're, they're doing different things. Sometimes you have different endings or did they want to track it in different directions, you know, the weird thing about game writing now is there are some people in the industry for writing games that recognize like, okay, we're spending 40, $50 million on a game, maybe more. Perhaps we should spend a few thousand dollars on getting a script writer who can write a script for us. Because otherwise sometimes what they do is like, well, that kid in cube three, he reads comic books. We'll just get him to write whatever. We, we'll just get him to do the fill in dialogue at the end. And I, I hate that because it's like, I, and I've had producers on games tell me like, I, the quality of your writing, I can't get that in the game industry a lot because usually they'll just have guys fill in lines because sometimes you get programmers that are afraid that if you're coming as a writer, you want to wreck everything they've already figured out about the game, yeah. not enhance it. And to me, it's like, no, I want to find a way to take your cool levels. And if we have to move this, these two levels here, and I'll show you why I would do that to play out a climax or If I've come in early enough in the process, I approach it like television writing. Because, again, sometimes you get people in the game industry and they think writing is alchemy, right? It's just some weird thing they don't understand. It comes out of your head. And I show them, no, it's a a logic process just like coding, right? It's like when you write for for, uh, television, I'm going to do the same thing we do for games. We have a premise. And I may pitch you six different premises and we'll vote on which one we like best. Or we'll mix and match. And then we'll go to the outline phase. And I'll write you an outline and we'll make notes on the outline. And again, we'll mix and match or we'll pull stuff in or we'll change things. And then we'll go to script. So we're all seeing it's all part of the process. It's all building, right? We're laying the foundation. Then we're building the first story. Then we're going up higher. And when they see that part of the process, when they see that it's not actually like I'm sitting around in a room throwing, you know, Wolf's Bane in a pot. Ah! Here's my script. You know, <laughs> you're going to read it, you programmers, right? And they actually see, oh, there's a logic to it. This is how it works. Then I, I really, I've had those have been my best writing experiences in the gaming world. Now, conversely, there have also been gaming companies that have hired big writers, writers who have names, either in Hollywood or sometimes in comic books, and they've been burned by these guys. Will just see games as like they're not game players. They don't really. Have, Oh, fuck it. Great. Oh, pardon me. They'll say, screw it. Right. You know, I'm going to get, you know, (laughs) I'm going to get, you know, 75 grand out of these guys. And I'm just going to copy the storyline I did for that comic book two years ago. Uh, And there have been big name. I can name Eisner award winning comic book guys who've done that. (laughs) And and then the problem is then they've they've burned they've burned producers so badly that then when I come in and I have credits and I say, no, no, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to. This is a craft for me. I'm going to craft this story for you. I'm not some big Hollywood guy who's just going to, you know, uh, take your, you know, $80,000 or whatever you're willing to pay me for this game and just crap it out and not care. Right. And so it's it's an interesting time. I, I There are some studios that are much more progressive with the writing. I have friends I've worked with who now, you know, like at Activision Blizzard, they're actually on staff, you know, because... You know, like Blizzard in particular, Blizzard does a lot of their stuff internally, right? They produce a lot of their uh, cutscenes and a lot of their intros and a lot of their trailers. They do that all internally, much to their credit, you know, that they've decided we need to control that process. You know, they're also very unique in that they've, you know, they make a lot of money. They make a lot of good games and they, they've taken their original concepts and they've been careful to, to craft them themselves. And so they have writers that work on staff and are dedicated to a lot of their games and do that. And I think I really appreciate 
game companies that do that. The last game I worked on, which was going to be great, and I can't talk about it because it was canceled, but it was <laughs> it was based. Uh-huh. On, That's when you should be able I to know. talk about it because it's not no, happening. It, it's going to forever live like a black op in Cambodia in 1973, and and so it. <laughs> But it was based on a, a classic game you would recognize, but doing a new twist on it. And we got deep into the process. And then what sort of screwed us up was the engineering team kind of couldn't deliver and they didn't like some of the play testing. And right before we started recording it, they pulled the plug on it. And so that happens uh. too, right? You know, that kind of, it's like, it's like anything else, right? It's like now they got to invest more money in, in finishing it off and they're not going to do that. Um, and so some game companies will also still, this happened to me the other day. Uh, I saw a job for a game writer. I, I, I sent them, I, oh, Mark Gray, we love you from, uh, and then they say, oh, by the way, uh, the, just to let you know, this job would be, you'd be based in Frankfurt, Germany, and we're looking for someone who would be willing to work for between 35 and 45K a year. And I said, well, thank you, but I, I, I I can't afford to eat on, on that kind of payment, but it's, it's that mindset yeah. where what they want is some young guy who is going to take direction. Well, or yet some young, young person, right. Guy or gal who's going to take direction really well and not going to make any waves, not going to say, here's how stories work. Here's what we should do. It's going to be somebody that we need six lines for this guy by tomorrow. Oh, uh-huh. okay. I'll just do it for, and I'll go back home and live with my six roommates. Cause that's the only way I can afford to live here in Frankfurt for $35,000 a year. So it also, it, it it is sort of, and I think, again, I think it's also a little bit in transition with them doing hybrid workspace and we don't necessarily need to have somebody here. So like that, to me, I, I can at least apply for a job in Europe because I have friends who are game writers, dedicated game writers, who now work in a hybrid space, right? They started working in Europe, pandemic hit, they now live in the United States. They still work for those companies. And Two, three times a year, they'll go check in with them live and meet the team. But the rest of the time, they're just staying in their house here writing. And so that's that. But that requires a whole shift in how management sees it, how management thinks about it, how, you know, it's interesting to me that like Elon Musk is demanding people be back in the office because, I, you know, I get that. But the world has changed now and a lot of workers don't want to do that. And. And unless you figure out a way to do it as a hybrid workspace, you're not you're not going to retain those workers. You're just not. It's interesting what's going to come of this. I think one of the most interesting, baffling things to me is the people who are pro work from home, but anti kids learning from home. I'm like, I don't know. Is that not just the same thing? Right. Like, do you just want to send your kids back to school so you can work at home alone and not do half your job and sit around in your PJs alone and not be bothered by your kid? Right. Is right. that why you have those two mindsets? Is that why uh, work or uh, distance learning is bad for your kid, but working from home is so beneficial to your m- mental health? I don't know, but yeah, I, you know, I, I understand like for me, I had to build when I went freelance. Uh, I already built this podcast studio. Right. But when I lost my job at iHeartRadio and decided to go freelance slash full time entertainer, I needed a space to work in. Right. I knew that I don't. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to sit on my couch and work. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to sit on my in my bedroom and work. I need a space that is dedicated to work. Yeah, you do. And then yeah. this is what worked for me. I have to come down here and do work. Or I have to go somewhere and do work at a place. Some people can just right. wake up, roll over, open their laptop, and start working. I am not that guy. I can't work in my lives, living space, and I can't live in my working space, apparently. But uh, I, so, well, you, know, I, you know, that's why I needed this space. It's weird because uh, in my old house, I have two kids, and, you know, they're both boys. So when they were young, they – right? Bunk bed, right? You're, you're in the same room. And then when they got older, right? Yeah, that's not working out, right? You know, you're touching my stuff. You're touching my stuff. Stand your side. Shut up, right? So I took, I got. <laughs> Don't cross this tape right, line. I got rid of my office and, and gave my office to my oldest son. So he, right. And then I I was, I was working in, on the dining room table for a while. And when I got a new place, I, I got a fourth bedroom strictly so that I could have a dedicated space again. Although I have to tell you, prior to the pandemic, I haven't started doing it again, but there were days when I would go out to sit in a coffee shop to write just because I wanted the ambiance of people around me. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'd buy a coffee and I'd sit and write. And it was just sort of fun to be like, okay, I'm kind of see people coming and going, but I'm still working out on in stuff. the world. Yeah. There's you're living a life. You're seeing people, 
you're interacting with people right. when you leave the house. You're seeing people interact with each other. You're living in a world that's going to inspire creativity, hopefully, in theory. Like, I, I'm a fan of, uh, of, I've had a couple of friends that have done work from home stuff prior to pandemic. And they all say that working from home is great, but I need like one day a week to be in the office right. just so I right. can interact with other humans. It's see, it's hybrid. So, like, hybrid I'm just in my yeah. house the whole time and I have to go out. And so most of them are, 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 aren't disappointed when I was like, oh, I go in the office two days a week because I need that human interaction yeah. Yeah. for my mental health yeah. and for my productivity. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, yeah, I think that's, I, I'm hoping that's the way it goes. I, I'm hoping that, you know, this coming year, you know, although they talk about maybe a recession hitting, but who knows, I'm hoping that we start figuring out, you know, like, if you read historically about like the Spanish flu pandemic a hundred years ago, how long it took, you know, the world didn't really figure it out till in some cases, 1925, you know, and then you got the roaring twenties coming on, right. For five or 10 years, right. You got until the great depression. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. it took, it took a while for that to, to those waves of illness to flow through the world, you know, and figure it all out. And it's so funny to me to see like, yeah, they, I remember hearing experts talking about that when this pandemic started, you know, and I was like, years, will it really be years? And now I'm like, oh, yeah, it'll be years. Right. And and so I, you're waiting to just see how it how it all shakes out and how it all changes. I mean, it's nice to see, you know, we're able to go back to comedy clubs now. But I had someone the other day I said, hey, I'm doing a set, you know, Saturday night. You should come down to see I would. But my boyfriend is still nervous about being around people because he has he's a cancer survivor. Right. And it's like. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. And I'm never going to say, no, you, you know, come cram yourself into a club if it makes you nervous, right? Because you're a cancer survivor yeah. and you might get a, a, a deadly illness. Right? It's like. Yeah, I, I came to a realization the other day that any woman and I'm not judging. I'm yeah. I, I Beginning of the pandemic, I was like, oh, this is all blow over. It's no big deal. I was wrong. I will admit yeah. I'm wrong. It's a big deal. And I got on the train of it's a big deal, people. Yeah. Very quickly, but I at this point in in uh, December of 2022, the amount of people that still wear masks on the on, on the train, on the subway, and the on yeah. the T, uh, I realized the other day while I was on it, I was like, oh, any woman that still wears a mask on the T is not a woman who's going to date me. There is not like I am unmasked on the T. I wash my hands. I stay away from people. I cover my mouth. I try to eat. I think eating. I think there's a lot of things that go into being healthy other than the mask. Like right. to me, I'm the first to say masks are preventative. If you have it, they're not protective. Yes, it protects you a little bit, but not really that much. It's really supposed to so, like there's a reason why the surgeon wears a mask and not the patient who's being cut open. If you right, understand right, what I'm yeah. saying, but yeah. And, and uh, but yeah, any woman who's still wearing a mask protective wise does not look at me and go, Oh, I'm going to be physically attracted to that person. No, they're like, they are, they, that woman and I will never live on the same plane of existence w the way we thought. And I just, I have to accept that, that there's a woman wearing a mask. There's zero. I think honestly, also I'm not saying, Hey, uh, yeah, some chick's going to walk on the train and see me and then she's going to go out of her mind crazy for me. Not not yeah. it either. But I realize if you're still wearing a mask on a train, you and I do not have things uh, in common. Well, I think it's also I was reading about, you know, with with it being related to China, the fact that they, they've handled it mainly through lockdowns and not through vaccines is going to be problematic when they open up because they, and that's why now if you look at their they're they're attempting to quickly vaccinate every everybody especially the, the older people in their population because they basically tried to approach it because they didn't have vaccines that were, were were as good as ours so they've they've approached it by locking down right it's it's a very severe approach but you know it's resulted in fewer deaths than we've had just because it's the most it's the you know the most severe thing you can do is lock everybody down um and now i feel like you know i i finally got covid this year i hadn't had it but it was like a cold no, oh, I'm sorry. I'm still batting a thousand. Yeah, see, and still batting a thousand. It was like a cold, and I, I the the shocking thing was I remember when I took the COVID test how quickly that line came on. I was like, oh, this is what this is. This is what's happening to me because the fever had already broken by the time <laughs> I took the test, and I was like, oh, that's mm. what that is. And I and I I hadn't been to like a big like herd of people or anything. I, it was just being out in the world. So, um, but I feel like yeah. Well, now the vaccines have done their job. We're not going around like. People aren't sh actively shedding the virus, so you don't need as much. So you don't need to wear the mask quite as much. But 
I think in certain circumstances, and the vaccinations will help with the rebound oh, yeah. and make the like we know yeah. that even if you're vaccinated and you get it, it's a lot more milder. It's to prevent you. you know, it's not ending up in the hospital. You know that's that's yeah. what it, you know. Same with a flu shot. It's to try to stop you from getting the most severe outcome. And so, uh, although I was at a, I was at a play the other night, a uh, big theater, and yeah, I'd say blah, blah, maybe twenty twenty five percent of people were wearing masks. And I think that was just because, you know, now it's both been here in LA County, it's been, you know, both flu and uh, COVID have hit up. So like the rates of people that are having uh, respiratory problems, having to go into the hospital has climbed. And so that I get it. Then I'm like, okay, fine. If it makes you feel safer, wear it, you know? Yeah. Which I'm fine. If you want to do, I I just did a, a weekend in Toronto for a comedy festival. Um, and this is what the things that I notice, like that make me wonder how much of this stuff is so performative. Like there was a comedian who performed with a mask on, mm. but then while doing social gatherings, as the days went on more and more, they, they started wearing their mask less, you know, yeah, yeah. less and yeah. less as the week went on. It's like, okay. All right. So like, are you feeling uncomfortable? Are you starting to realize that maybe this is not necessary? Are you, Succumbing to peer pressure, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know. I got that beat. The play I saw the other night was called Ain't Too Proud, and it's the story of the Temptations. And it's really well done. <laughs> it was really well. Lots of singing, lots of dancing. Obviously, a lot of the Temptations music. So at the end, they all come out and do their curtain calls, and then they get the band out of the orchestra pit, and they come out and they do some quick takes as the band. The saxophone ca- player came out. He was playing the saxophone while wearing a mask. I was like, I was like, wait, what? He had the mask on and yeah, he had I, the sax. I was like, wow, I guess you can do that. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, the people who are at this point who are still wearing a mask under their nose is like, you're not fooling anybody. Yeah. You, you know by now how unhelpful. And this I'm is. like looking. And of course, I saw somebody yeah. the other day pull their mask down to talk to me. I'm like, you're still defeating the point of the mask. Yeah. Stop it. I was like, I was like, wow. <laughs> Either wear it or don't. I, was like, I don't care. I was like, well, the Trump, what your choice the is? Trumpet player can't. Can't uh, can't uh, play the trumpet with a mask on. But I was looking. I'm like, has he cut a hole in that mask? No, I guess. I guess if you're in the woodwind <laughs> section, you can play with a mask on. You, you can br- you can blow through it at 95. I guess probably not the flute or the piccolo. But I, then I was thinking about which instruments <laughs> can you play with a mask on, right? So but it was it was it was what, fascinating. Guitar, harp, piano. Right? Yeah, piano, drums. Yeah. Right. Drums, of course. Yeah. yeah. Although drums are so physical, man. I know you need that. Like I will, I, I keep uh, underestimating uh, how out of breath wearing a mask can make you. And I don't want to be one of those yeah. like, Oh, it's suffocating you. But no, literally you're, it, well, what was interesting? It does make breathing a, a, like heavy. Like when you're physically active, wearing what a was mask interesting does make it more difficult to breathe. To me during this play is uh, that, you know, because they're so physical, right. They're doing the temptations moves and everything. They were all mic'd on their foreheads. They had little tiny mics on their foreheads. Because, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, they're doing all these costume changes, right? They're doing all these spinny, you know, great moves. They can't, they can't, they can't have mics anywhere else, right? So it was, it was interesting. Yeah. It was interesting to see. Because well, even like the, the, with the ones that come off along the cheek, they still can get in the way with costume yeah, changes. Yeah, exactly. Whereas up here, it's held down by either the hair or the wig that they're wearing. Right. So even if they're pulling shirts, off, you know, off and on, it's still. Tied down, you know, taped right, down. Right, right. It was fascinating. It was fascinating. It was it was a very good show, though. I have to say, I really, really enjoyed it. And I forgot how how much music the Temptations produced, you know, over the course of that group. Uh, and then, uh, final question, and then we'll let you get back to writing. Um, how great is San Diego Comic Con? Oh, San Diego Comic Con! Someone who's never gone. It's, it's I I want to go. I've been hoping. I've been trying. When I when I worked for iHeartRadio, I tried every single year <laughs> and. Uh, I, I left, uh, I was dismissed from iHeartRadio in 2018. So that's kind of right around the big blow up of what San Diego Comic-Con became. And I tried every year from 2003 to 2018 to get the company to pay pay me to go to San Diego Comic-Con and report on it. And they would never bite for it. So I just have to, it's, I have, please, how, how great is it's it? It's really fun. And the, the other fun thing is like, I've been on several panels that were really big and really fun. I was on the Marvel games panel when I wrote the superhero squad game. I was on a panel two years ago for Marvel animation that we were honoring Stan Lee and our memories of Stan Lee because it was the first, that was 2019. 
So it was, yeah, it was the first Comic Con after his passing and pre pre all the pandemics. So it was, you know, that's really fun when you're in a big room full of people and they want to hear stories about stuff. It's really, but also just the atmosphere of walking around and seeing the artists and seeing the comic books. Um, and I have, I have a special superpower and it's called crowd walking because I used to work at Disneyland for two summers in college. I worked at Disneyland and I had to develop a way to walk through it, weave through a crowd very quickly. And so my brother <laughs> says, your superpower is crowd walking because at times I don't realize I'm doing it. Unfortunately, my brother's six, four. So he said, you'll get through the crowd and I'll turn around and my brother's like, you know, half, half the <laughs> convention floor away from me trying to get through the crowd. Cause I'll like, I'll he goes, that, it, it's, dude, it's like your superpower. You're just like the crowd walker. I'm like, yeah, it's it's not very sexy, but, you know, um, <laughs> but it's, you know, I went this year and it's not, you know, it wasn't back to the same level. I'd say it was it was fun, but it wasn't as big and people were still a little nervous. Right. And you had to go get a wristband to show that you were you either tested on site or that you had they checked your vac- vaccination. And then in the halls, they made you wear a mask. Um and they actually were very proactive about making sure you had your mask on. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, it's just one of those things where uh, it's just the atmosphere is really great. It's, it's, it's weird to me because I lived through the time where uh, my son used to collect, uh, you know, Batmobiles. Because every year, like the Mattel booth, you could go to the Mattel booth and you get the special Batmobile for it. You could just go buy it. Now the way they work the toys at Comic-Con is you have to go early in the morning and get a wristband to stand in line to maybe get the thing, right? And so now you see uh, the professional toy guys that are there to buy. They they strictly, they they come there with their friends or their families or they come there and they're they're just there to get line up and get wristbands, get as many toys as they can. And you'll see them on eBay that night, you know, Comic-Con exclusive Batmobile, right? And it's like, so I had friends when I was working for Lego, they were like, can you get me the Lego? I said, actually, I can't. Because I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be there at the convention center at seven thirty to stand in line and get the thing. I can't. You, they 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 just don't hand them out like that anymore. They used to. In fact, hold on. I'm knocking stuff over. I still have this from. This is the superhero squad. I think this was the Comic Con edition with uh, the mayor who was Stan Lee. Uh, so they used to hand out stuff like that all the time. Also, hold on. Let me grab this while I'm. It's on the same shelf over here. Uh, y'all like this? Hold on. Come here, guys. Out of the way. I have to get this guy off the shelf. I put my ear thing back in. This is one of the toys I still have from Spider-Man: The Animated Show, the Talking Spider-Man. Let's see if the battery's still. Oh working. my god. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, oh, dude! It. See, that's the thing. Like, uh, I, I I try not to get too jealous about those uh, when I miss the Comic Con exclusive stuff. Yeah. But I totally when I see right around July when people start showing the things they got, I was like, oh man, I want those. I know. Oh. Yeah. But I will. I will not buy them. I I I'm a firm believer that is. I I don't want to buy a thing that's an exclusive to the thing I wasn't a part of. Like, I'm not going right, to buy a tour right. T-shirt from a band I didn't go see in concert. You know. Right. Right. Like. And also, I don't need more stuff. I have too uh, much junk as it is. Tell me about like, it. I'm uh. doing I, like all, um, every winking moment is me thinking about when I can finally get myself together and move to L.A. Yeah. And think about how much stuff I have to get rid of before I move to L.A. It's just the way of getting rid of it. I have stuff I acquired when I worked at Lego that, you know, like I've just held on to for the sake of, you know. Lego dimensions. Oh, is that a Back to the Future Back Lego? Back to the Future oh, dimensions, yeah. And, nice. and what was nice about this was then several years ago at Comic-Con, they ha- actually had a um, they had a guy that had a booth where he sold old animation cells. And I did one of the first gigs I had at Universal when I went to Universal was I worked on Back to the Future, the animated show. I wrote an episode that takes place <gasps> in Boston about baseball. Um, yes. Yeah. I know. That. And, I remember that, that cartoon. Yeah, and I was able to find a cell from that episode at Comic-Con that I bought for like 20 bucks. And it's, it's, oh it's Thomas Biff Wilson in the, in the chair. They, there was a, there's a scene that I wrote where he gets a, he gets a barber cause they they put a barbershop quartet in it. And it's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous baseball thing. <laughs> and I, I tried to make it, I think they changed the name, I think for legal reasons, 
but I tried to make it because one of the original franchises in Boston were the Boston Bean Eaters. Yeah. And I made them the Boston Bean Eaters. Which sounds like a very, it sounds like an insult. It sounds like a racial slur. What? You Bean Eaters. Well, it also just sounds like a cartoon <laughs> version of, that can't have been a real team, can it? And it's like, yeah, it was, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so that's the other cool thing about Comic-Con is you find stuff like that. Like you'll, you'll find stuff like, I like I never thought I'd have a sell from that. And there I found it down at Comic-Con, you know, it's like, oh, OK, that's great. You know, I, I honestly like that. I, I, I wonder if like when you buy that, like, did you tell the guys like I wrote this? This is my yeah. episode. I'm buying a cell from the episode. Like, OK, sure. Or, like, do they believe well, you? they do? They do because most of those people are fans. That So I, I was I went to that guy's booth the next year, I remember. And and he had he had a cell. I bought an ant in the aardvark cell that he had gotten from. Uh, the Pink Panther series. And so, in fact, hold on, hold on here, folks. Yeah, see, well, I have, this is an old Hanna-Barbera cell I have. I don't know if you remember, do you remember Jabberjaw? Oh, uh, I do, yeah. yes. The uh, oh. the uh, the the Scooby the Scooby Doo of the sea. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Jabberjaw, we got Jabberjaw, um, and I think these. I think this is where I have my other cells. Hold on, let me check. Let me check in here. Got my Jabberjaw. Aha! It's Quick Draw. Yes. Quick... By, by the way, Looney Racers is. I I found out so many other. Hanna Barber, uh, Hanna Barber, Hanna Barbera cartoon characters just because of wacky racers. Yeah. Like I, w I remember watching that and just going, how with like, Hey, there's like six different versions of, uh, Ooh, nice. Uh, uh doc Brown. I got it cause of the, the car. I got series. it cause the car was in the background. Yeah. Oh, Oh, you have to. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and 20 bucks for that. That's so Can you cheap. imagine? Uh, also I, I, I mean, wrote that, on the Carmen. And, and the thing that, that means so much more to you than it does any other right. collector because I wrote it is it. a thing that you were a part Car of. I wrote on the Carmen, Carmen San Diego Diego. animated series, so I got that one. Hold on. Let me, there's a bunch of them slipped off my lap here. Why are you sliding? Stop being so sliding. <laughs> um, hold on. Let's see which one is that? Okay. This one. Oh, yeah. There's Marty with the car. Marty and Marty with the DeLorean. And then uh, I, I love this. It's the Pink Panther with a sandwich. <laughs> just, just a random yeah. sandwich. And then and then Ant in the Aardvark with the Aardvark rolling a rock off a cliff. Oh, wow, man. And that's the thing. It's like you wrote on those things and then you're finding them secondhand from somebody else at a comic book convention. I know. It, that who knows where they were. They just got a lot of them, a, a lot somewhere. Yeah. And now they're just selling and it. That's out. exactly. And what's the odds yeah. of that? The person who was involved with the show finding it, right? And that you know, to me, that that was what was so cool. You know, that's the kind of cool thing about Comic Con is you'll find a lot of collectibles like that, or you'll find, you know, like 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 you talking about looking for you know comic books and stuff. You'll find comic books that you know complete your collection there too. Yeah, that was the best thing about living in Baltimore was the Baltimore Comic Con was even to this day it's still so much more comic book focused than than most other comic cons. Yeah. I, you know, I've been to local comic book conventions, but, and I've been at such, like, I loved watching, you know, and nobody does it now in the time where we can do this technology wise. Like, so many people, use, like, G4, MTV Geek, and like one other outlet used to stream live from the floor of Comic Con. And it used to be just such a mess. And now, technology wise, where we can do this great, do it well. Nobody's doing it, and it's like I want to still watch these comic book coverage. I mean, Marvel does their stream. Yeah, Marvel and, did a stream. Uh, there's smaller streams. Yeah, there's smaller streams, right. but like G4, MTV Geek, and then there was one over like Spike TV. Oh, and you'd see them, which was awful. You'd see Spike em. TV's was terrible. Yeah. Spike TV, like when they started doing the Comic Con uh, streamings, they basically hired a bunch of ESPN uh, jock sport announcer rejects. <laughs> To do it, and they l clearly did not care about comic books, had no interest in in, in that people. genre. Yeah. They're making fun of it. I hated their coverage so much. Yeah, it no, it's it's an event, and at some point in time, y'all y'all have to go because it's just it's crazy. It's crazy good fun, you know. Yeah, 
Well, speaking of crazy good fun, this interview and conversation has been crazy good fun. Uh, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time and opening up about getting into your business, into the business of writing and comedy and your journey through because it's been it sounds like it's been a fun and amazing journey. It's been really fun. And thank thank you, Dennis. It's you know, it's it's always great, too. I like, you know, it's like people like you that I say, you know, this this is the good stuff that happened out of the pandemic. I got to connect with people I wouldn't (laughs) connect with. Right. You know, and to me, that's the like, you know, I, I there are times when I miss uh doing a lot of the zoom comedy. Cause you could do two, three shows yep. a week and you're meeting people from around the country and it's really fun. You know, dude, I have a local show that I, here in Boston that I picked up that I'm doing monthly, you know, on the third Thursday of the month. And I start rolling through like Facebook messages, trying to think of which comics I want to book for it. And I keep going, Oh, I just want to book comedians that don't live in Boston. I want to right. book all my friends right. from L.A., New yeah. York, Washington, like everyone from Florida. All these comedians that I hung out with on the panel was like, I want to book all of them on this local show. I, I need to get back into Zoom again. Which, by the way, I also had a monthly Zoom show that I was booking. I was like, it's too much. I don't yeah. have the time to, to, to devote to it. Uh, and now I hate running shows anyway, but at I least know. I get to hang out occasionally with people. And it's like. I don't want to keep hanging out with the same people who are in Boston. There's so many people in Boston that suck and they're annoying, and I don't want to hang out with them either. I just want to hang out with my Zoom friends. Yeah, I, I know, that, exactly. That, like, like, there's so many, like, every time I was like, oh, I'll get, they're not going to show up here tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I can drive 10 hours yeah. here. It's fun, though. Well, thanks, but, man. All right, this has been great. It was great, yeah. My pleasure, man. And, uh, yeah, well, let's talk soon.